At 6.15 p.m. on Monday, the doorbell rang, and to my surprise, I found my cousin Ralph there. It was unusual for me to be home before midnight, and I decided that Ralph had forgotten about my schedule. I invited him into the house, bought him a beer, and we sat down to watch night football. Ralph seemed a little disappointed that my wife Lois wasn't home, but she called earlier and said she would join us after work as she was going to have a drink with colleagues. She mentioned that she would be ready for a drink upon arrival home, and I was looking forward to it. It's been over three weeks since Lois and I were close, as she seemed to be going through a period of depression. She was constantly coming up with excuses. She was tired, she had a headache, her body ached after work. When Ralph left, I said goodbye to him and looked at my watch, realizing that it was only 8 o'clock. I got another beer and settled back in front of the TV. In the end, I dozed off in an armchair, which happened to me infrequently because of the relaxing effect of beer. When I woke up later, I noticed a Yukon parked in front of the house, which indicated that Lois had reached home. I couldn't help but wonder why she hadn't come for me so we could get into bed and make love. Fortunately, she seemed to support me when I finally made a move. The next day, on the way home, I wondered why she was constantly looking for a reason to refuse me. It made me doubt my worth in her eyes. After a few weeks of living together, Lois suddenly asked me if she was too loose. The question caught me off guard and seemed strange, but I didn't want to seem stupid and answered, No, not at all. I guess I'm just not good enough for you. Lois assured me that I was fine. I knew she was lying, but I didn't want to admit it. From the guy's point of view, it seemed wrong. I was honest with myself. My size was smaller than the one she was used to, but it didn't matter. I was in love with Lois, and when I proposed to her, she accepted it without hesitation. And although she agreed, my doubts did not leave me. And yet I kept trying to wake her up for caresses, hoping that our love would triumph. Oh, it's you, Lois allegedly whispered sleepily. My initial disappointment when I discovered that she was sleeping in bed, despite promising to wake up, quickly turned into rage. I was fed up with her deceptive behavior. Who did she think she was fooling with this act? Who was she entertaining behind my back? I jumped out of bed, grabbed my shorts off the floor and headed downstairs. I took a beer and went out onto the patio to calm down and reflect on the betrayal that had just happened. At first, she looked interested, but as soon as she realized it was me, she quickly refused. There was contempt in her voice, as if she was thinking, not him. Looking at the night sky, for the first time in our marriage, I couldn't help but wonder if she was really spending time with her girlfriends. Suddenly I was filled with doubts. Were all these activities she was doing away from me really innocent? I came up with the idea of hiring a detective, but I quickly figured out where to get the money for it. I couldn't help but wonder what this woman does in her free time. Another thought occurred to me. From the way I bumped into her, she seemed to know exactly what I was thinking, but didn't bother to come down, apologize, or fix the situation. She just didn't seem to care. I didn't want to go back upstairs, so I went inside and sat down to watch TV. I had a tape ready with the last episode of the NCIS series. Rummaging through a stack of tapes, I finally found the only clean one. I put it in the VCR and started watching the video. I learned everything I needed from him. Stopping him, I tiptoed upstairs to check if Lois was asleep. She was already snoring softly. Back downstairs, I continued watching. My heart sank when I saw on the screen how my wife and cousin Ralph entered the bedroom. The camera was hidden on the top shelf of the closet, so it filmed almost the entire room. It became clear to me that they had done this before. Betrayal stung me when I thought about how many times she cheated on me with other men. Pain overwhelmed me as I looked at the strange man standing in front of her. What have I done to deserve this? Behind me, I heard Lois's panicked voice frantically dialing a number on the phone, muttering as she did so. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! She exclaimed, betraying her guilt. Answer for God's sake, answer! Pick up the damn phone! Oh, Ralph! Dave's got us figured out! He found that stupid recording you made, I don't know how! 
You should have taken her with you when you left, but you couldn't, could you? Dave is here and watching it right now. Lois screamed into the phone in a panic. I should have known where my NCIS tape was. I got up and walked over to Lois, but she flinched and stepped away from me. I quickly snatched the phone out of her hands. Ralph, why don't you come over here and get the tape? Just don't forget to wear a bulletproof vest when you do it. It's probably better for you to stay away from me in the future. In the future, I plan to attend all family gatherings and hope to see you there too. I won't look for you, but I know that sooner or later our paths will cross. And when that day comes, it will be the most terrible in your miserable existence, I said threateningly. I angrily hung up the phone, looked at Lois and exclaimed, Thanks to you and my idiot cousin I don't need to hire a private investigator. Both of you have provided me with all the necessary evidence. I rushed to the VCR, grabbed the tape and held it to me to turn on the TV. Lois asked in a trembling voice, What are you going to do? I snapped, What do you think? I will file for divorce. Lois begged, But I don't want to get divorced. I grinned and said, Why not, right? Now it's clear to me that you don't care about me. Pack your things and leave before I lose my temper and give you what you deserve. She stormed out of the room, and as soon as she left, I replaced the damaged cassette with a new one on the TV and hid the damaged one in the kitchen. After making coffee, I sat down at the kitchen table and started making a list of things to do in the morning. There was no such rule as no fault in our state. I was aware that when dividing property, the courts usually adhere to a 50-50 ratio unless it is about infidelity or criminal activity. The news of adultery took me by surprise, especially since I had evidence on tape. I got the house from my parents, and I had been planning to include Lois in the property list for a long time, but fortunately, I did not decide. While I was updating the list, I heard Lois coming down the stairs, and a few minutes later the sound of the front door opening and closing. I couldn't help but wonder where she could have gone at two in the morning. I was completely indifferent. I was surprised how quickly love can turn into hate. After looking at the list, I realized that using the internet, you can find a solution. When I came to my room, I saw that the empty cassette that I had left on the TV was missing. A grin appeared on my face. I hope she was found and did not interfere with the viewing. If everything goes according to plan, I can finally break off my relationship with her. After going to my room, I sat down in front of the computer and started managing my finances online. I transferred almost all the money from our joint account to a savings account belonging only to me, leaving only $10. I've been keeping this account since I married Lois because she had her own separate account that we never combined. Next, I sorted out our credit cards. I paid the bills electronically and cancelled our joint accounts. Since my American Express and Visa cards were issued only in my name, I decided to keep them the same. The next morning I called and confirmed that the accounts had been successfully closed. Feeling that I had taken all the necessary precautions to ensure my safety, I went to bed and, surprisingly, fell into a peaceful doze. The alarm clock woke me up at 7 o'clock and by 7.45 I was already dressed and out of the house. After a quick breakfast at the Tricacci, I went to the bank to arrive at 9 o'clock, when they would open their doors. At the restaurant, I took a moment to call work and inform the secretary about my lateness, but I found out that my wife had tried to call me and asked me to call her back. Rejecting the idea of contacting her, I ended the conversation and continued my day. I rented a safe exclusively in my own name and moved all the things from the drawer that Lois previously had access to a new one. After completing this task, I went to the office where Myra, my secretary, handed me a stack of message sheets and mentioned that Lois was trying to reach me. I informed Myra of my divorce from Lois and asked her not to receive any messages from my wife. Then Myra informed me that Alan, my boss, wanted to meet with me right after I arrived. I headed to Alan's office where Shirley, his personal assistant, told me to come right in. You couldn't have chosen a worse time to be late. He scolded me when I entered the room. I need you on the next flight to Atlanta. Morgan's company is bothering us about the new contract, and I need you to fly over there and sort it out. 
I tried to explain that now was not the right time for my departure, and detailed the urgent need for a restraining order against Lois and a change of locks to protect the house during my absence. Just give me the keys, he insisted. I'll take care of it. I strongly recommend using the services of Bert Ellsworth, my lawyer, during the divorce. He did a great job for me, and I'll tell him to wait for your call. Feel free to contact him on the way to the airport, the boss advised me. Shirley had already booked tickets for me at the Delta box office, which I couldn't refuse because of the large salary. So I had to fly to Atlanta, whether I liked it or not. I quickly packed my bag, made sure the answering machine was on, and headed to the airport. I dialed the number of the lawyer Alan had recommended and asked to be put through to Ellsworth. The secretary quickly put me through to him after I gave my name. I explained the situation in detail and informed Ellsworth of my intentions. He offered me some advice, to which I reciprocated by telling him my card number for recording. At the airport, I went through the usual screening procedure, went to the Delta check-in desk, completed the process, and settled in the boarding area waiting for my flight to be announced. As I sat there, I reflected on the advice that the lawyer had given me. Unfortunately, I deceived Ellsworth by mistakenly stating that I needed a warrant. I heard Ralph warn Lois that if I caught them having fun and made a scene, he would step in and deal with me. I confessed to Ellsworth that I would not hesitate to teach Ralph a lesson until he realized his mistake. Then I pretended that I had heard Lois willingly offer to look after me so that Ralph would deal with me, but it was all fiction. I was willing to lie to keep Lois out of the house until I got back, even if the truth never came out during the plea hearing. After enduring countless lies from her, Ralph's entertainment, and God knows how many other people, I finally decided to act. Ellsworth assured me that it would not be difficult to get a restraining order, but to make it permanent, I would have to appear at the hearing in 10 days. Fortunately, my trip to Atlanta turned out to be useful, because after meeting with Morgan's people, I quickly resolved this issue. Wasting no time, I called Alan and informed him that we now have a signed contract. To my surprise, he had already begun to act. He changed the locks in the house with the help of a locksmith. My brother-in-law, who works as a deputy sheriff, will look after the house while you're gone, Alan assured me. During my stay in Atlanta, I took the opportunity to visit two more clients before heading home. While I was waiting for my flight to be announced, I realized that I had forgotten to turn on my mobile phone. After checking my phone, I found that I had missed six messages and three voicemails. One message and one voicemail were from Ellsworth, and the rest were from Lois. I deleted her messages and listened to her voice messages. They all said the same thing. Call me. We need to talk before the situation escalates. A voicemail from Ellsworth said he had received a protective order in court and would hand it over to Lois at her job the next morning. I mentally thanked Alan for Ellsworth's recommendation. At midnight, when I drove up to my entrance, a man got out of a parked car and started walking towards me. Introducing himself as a deputy sheriff, he asked to show his ID. You must be Alan's son-in-law, I remarked, taking out my wallet and showing my driver's license. I expressed my gratitude that he was looking after the house. Then the assistant handed me a ring and a bunch of keys, saying that Brian instructed him to tell me that all locks in the house are locked with the same keys. This means that only one key is needed to access all locked doors. He mentioned that my wife was there at 4.30 and at 9 o'clock in the evening. She was furious when I refused to let her into the house. Threatening to involve the police if I didn't comply, she quickly changed her behavior when I showed her my badge and informed her that law enforcement agencies were already present. Alan's son-in-law proudly replied. When I entered the house, I noticed a blinking light on the answering machine, but feeling tired, I decided to turn off the phone and go to bed. The next morning after finishing my morning chores, I listened to the messages left on my answering machine and found that they were all from Lois and they all had the same content. Please call me before you make any impulsive decisions. I couldn't help but think that it was too late. When I arrived at the office, 
Myra informed me that Lois had tried to get in touch again, but, following instructions, refused to transmit any messages. Thanking her with a kiss on the forehead, I couldn't help but express my appreciation for her dedication. Myra just grinned and replied, I don't know how you would have coped without me. When I entered Alan's office, I informed him about Morgan's problem and expressed gratitude that he had fixed the lock in my house and referred me to Ellsworth. What are you going to do next? He asked. I plan to move on and hopefully find a wonderful woman who can tolerate me, I replied. You will succeed. The first few months may be difficult, but everything will get better, he reassured me. Then I went to my office and got to work. I called Ellsworth at 9, and he assured me that the papers would be filed by 10. He also offered to give them to Lois before lunch if I wanted to. I gave him the green light. By 10 o'clock, Myra suddenly dropped by my office and offered to have lunch with me. Feeling the need to take a break, I accepted her invitation. We went to Tricochi, found empty seats, and made an order. While we were waiting for food, Myra asked, How are things going? I replied, Great, why are you asking? She then revealed that her older brother and sister were going through a divorce. I understand how difficult it can be when you are just starting this process. If you have someone to talk to who is not directly involved in the process, it will definitely help ease the situation, she said with understanding. Do you want to apply for this position? I asked with a grin. It's always nice when someone cheers you up, but who could be better than me? Do you need support? Myra laughed and responded in kind. I could use it right now, I said with sadness in my eyes. Myra reached into her purse, took out a piece of paper and handed it to her. I looked at the paper and noticed that there was a list of names on it. Curious, I asked, what is it? Myra replied, this is a list of girls who are interested in you now that you're single again. Intrigued, I read the list of names and was struck by several surprises. Liz Fisher, the stunning red-haired girl from accounting? I got the impression that she was engaged, I asked incredulously. Obviously she caught her fiancé cheating and broke off the relationship, Myra replied. Could it be that she's interested in me now? I asked again. I knew about her intentions. She once mentioned that she would pursue you if you were free, Myra replied. Looking at the list again, I saw seven names, including Mary's name and two more that caught my attention. So you're saying that they're all interested? I asked. I've heard them mention their interest in you several times, she replied. I couldn't help but smile and tease her. I see that your name is not on the list. I thought about adding it, but considering the situation, I decided not to, Myra said with a laugh. Why? I asked. Besides the fact that I'm already married and you know about it? She replied. Indeed, you have now admitted that you have thought about it, I said with a hint. The reason is that you are currently in the process of divorce because of your wife's infidelity. I assumed that in such a situation, the last thing that would occur to you is to date a married woman who is also involved in extramarital affairs, Myra replied. Are you playing a dangerous game? I got the impression that you and Harold had a strong relationship, I asked incredulously. They were, until I found out that he was having an affair with his secretary at work, Myra replied sadly. Instead of getting divorced, I chose to lead a comfortable lifestyle and be kind to him, Myra said. You have one misconception. Even if I knew you were married, it wouldn't stop me. Maybe you should have included your name on the list. You would be the perfect match for me at the moment, I replied. I understand that you were joking. I am far from an ideal woman, she said with a laugh. But you're wrong here. There are three names on your list that intrigue me. But you have a certain quality that they don't have, I simply replied. And what does that mean? She asked. You're married, but they're not, I replied. This is a situation that needs some clarification, she demanded an answer. I don't need any emotional attachments right now. It would be too risky to enter into an emotional relationship with three people on your list who interested me. On the contrary, 
You've already devoted yourself to this case and mentioned that you don't mind playing games with your spouse. If we are going to have a case it will be only physical without emotional attachments. We'll just be friends with privileges, I suggested. Are you kidding? Or is it true? Myra asked incredulously. Absolutely. Let's get this straight, honey. I would never pursue a married woman, but if she is free, then that's a completely different story. How about planning a leisurely lunch tomorrow? I asked. I don't mind. Unfortunately, today I have a meeting at 2 o'clock, but tomorrow I am free all day, she replied. It was a date. Was it hypocritical of me to date another woman while married to Lois, especially after I kicked her out for cheating? Not at all. Ellsworth made it clear that Lois had to get the divorce papers before I could move on, so meeting Myra for lunch was justified. When I sat down at my desk at 2.45 in the afternoon, the phone rang and I saw Lois's name on the screen. Most likely she was finally given the documents. I decided to take the call. What do you need? I asked directly, skipping all the pleasantries. I resisted the urge to lash out at her with more colorful expressions, knowing that she was already well aware of my feelings for her. Why can't I enter the house? What's going on with the divorce? Why are my credit cards not working? And the protective order, are you crazy? I paused and then added with a bitter laugh, No, you're just crazy. Your credit cards are not working because one of the steps taken to eliminate a cheating spouse is to cancel her credit cards. And you can't get into the house because you don't live there anymore. And I don't want you in it. I answered her questions. Dave, you need to put an end to this behavior. Do you really want to risk losing half of everything you have because of an affair? It was just a pointless affair, Dave. There were no feelings in her, only physical pleasure. I only love you, not another person, she said. Lois, I look at it differently. In my opinion, you are unfaithful and unfaithful to me, which is why I submitted an application stating adultery as the reason, I replied. We need to talk about this, Dave. Let's sit down and discuss this face to face. When and where do you want to meet? At 10 o'clock today? She asked. I don't think so. I've already asked you to leave the house and I won't let you come back. I replied. You can't stop me from entering the house, Dave. Lois said. No, I can. Lois, this house is in my name. You're not on the title deed. My parents purposely left the house to me, not both of us. I am ready to let you come in and pack your things, but only after my lawyer organizes a court representative to make sure that you take only what is rightfully yours, I said. Could you put aside the legal issues and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk? She asked with tears in her eyes. I'm ready to discuss anything with you, just not in this house, I replied glumly. Dave, you're being unreasonable. If not at home, then where? What is it? she asked. Let's meet tomorrow night at 6 o'clock at the Angelina restaurant. We can sit in the booth at the back to have some privacy, I said. I hung up, wondering if Lois really thought I was gullible enough to believe her lies. It was just physical intimacy. I only love you. Those words echoed in my mind, but deep down I knew the truth. And maybe I gave her a reason to think I was stupid. I was stupid enough to let her continue her deceptive actions for too long. That evening after returning home from work, I decided to go to the landing strip bar to have a drink or two and numb my pain. It was an open mic night on Wednesday, and I was hoping that one of the comedians would be able to make me smile. When I was sitting at the bar, Karen came up to me and asked, As usual, Dave? I replied, I'm not sure, dear. I usually order a whiskey and coke and a date with you. Maybe you should have a beer, Dave, she suggested. It's a pity you're not going on a date. It looks like it's just whiskey and coke so far, I said with a grin. Meanwhile, on an elevated stage, a woman was trying to perform a stand-up comedy. A surveyor came to Will's farm in eastern Minnesota and broke the unexpected news. I found out that your farm is not in Minnesota, he said. She's actually in Wisconsin. The girl on stage said. Will let out a long sigh of relief and exclaimed, This is the most joyful news I've heard in a while. Just this morning I was telling my wife that I couldn't stand another winter in Minnesota. She laughed and replied, 
According to the New York City Department of Education, only 26% of students in grades 3 through 8 successfully passed the English language exam. But on the other hand, they don't know math well enough to fully understand the gravity of the situation. Everyone laughed politely at this anecdote, and she moved on to another story. During the tour, the new pastor visited the homes of his parishioners. In one of the houses, it was clear that someone was inside, but no one answered his repeated knocks. Then he took out a card, wrote Revelation chapter 3.20 on the back, and taped it to the door. The following Sunday, when donations were being collected, he was surprised to find that the card had been returned to him. The chapter of Genesis 310 was written on it. Curious, he looked at this verse in his Bible and couldn't help but laugh, she continued joking. Revelation 320 begins with the words, Look, I'm standing at the door and knocking. Genesis 3.10 says, I heard you in the garden and I was scared because I was naked. After a great performance by two more comedians, I left feeling elated, proving that laughter is the best medicine. The next day at work, Myra quickly reminded me of our lunch meeting as soon as I sat down at my desk. It was a hectic morning, and by 11.30, Myra and I decided to go out for lunch. On the way to the Marriott, I jokingly asked Myra if she really wanted to eat first, to which she replied with a laugh, Having fun on a full stomach slows me down a little. I registered us under the names Mr. and Mrs. Ralph Tomlinson as a sign of respect for our friend Lois. Once in the room, we did not waste any time and immediately began to enjoy our rest on the bed. The day flew by, and soon it was time to meet Lois at Angelina's. I came first and chose the booth at the back of the hall, the one farthest from the noisy dance floor and providing the most peace of mind. I made my usual order and began to relax, waiting for Lois to appear. When she finally appeared, she looked amazing, as always, but I couldn't summon the usual feeling of attraction. The betrayal she committed in my marriage extinguished any spark between us. When she was settled in her seat, the waitress came over, and Lois quickly ordered her signature Cosmopolitan. Annoyance showed on her face when I demanded a separate bill from the waitress. After taking a sip of beer, I turned to Lois and said, Okay, Lois, you wanted to have this meeting yourself, so come on, give your opinion. Lois replied, Honestly, Dave, you could have been more polite. I replied, Considering the situation, Lois, consider yourself lucky that I didn't lose my temper. Threatening to leave if she didn't start talking, Lois sighed and told me, You're making a big deal out of a molehill, Dave. We shouldn't end our marriage. I've always loved you and I always will. The situation with Ralph doesn't matter to me at all. Although I had a physical relationship with him, it was purely physical. I didn't even like him most of the time. He never posed a threat to our marriage, she said. If he means nothing to you, why did you choose him over me? You neglected me for him, didn't you? Think about the last six months. How often have you made love to me? Rarely and reluctantly, I said. Remember the last three weeks? I've been patiently listening to your excuses night after night, preferring not to get involved in the drama. Meanwhile, you were having fun with someone else. And this is what you consider love for me and only for me? Are you saying it hasn't been that long? And it seems to me that a whole eternity has passed. You've been avoiding me for three weeks. And when she finally decided to make me happy with her presence at home, she immediately went to bed and fell asleep. When I tried to start something, you didn't agree until you realized that I was already at the limit. Does this remind you of anything, Lois? I asked. Now I recognize you. That's who you are. Stop it, she screamed. I'm tired. Please give me some freedom. Lois, it's all you. These simple phrases speak only about you. And this record was the last straw and all those words spoken to Ralph about what a wonderful lover he is. What is it for? I asked. Because Ralph was hungry for confirmation. He has an irresistible desire to feel superior to you. I said these words to amuse his ego. There's nothing missing about you as a partner, Dave. You've always satisfied me, Lois said with tears in her eyes. Then why do you like spending time with other men? I asked. 
It's not just other men, Dave, it's just Ralph, she replied with a shrug. So you're saying that it doesn't count as cheating because it's just Ralph? I asked with a bitter smile. That's not what I wanted to say, she began. It doesn't change anything, Lois. It doesn't matter if it's one man or several making love to someone other than her husband is still considered treason, regardless of the circumstances, I interrupted her. Let me ask you something, Dave. Before watching this tape, would you say that we had a strong marriage? What is it? She asked. Maybe decent, but definitely not perfect, I replied. I had a relationship with Ralph before the wedding, but it didn't affect our marriage in any way, Lois unexpectedly confessed. Did you spend time with my jerk cousin before we tied the knot? I asked in shock. Yes, I did, she replied. Then why did you marry me? I asked. Because I love you, Dave. I don't have those feelings for Ralph, Lois said. Then why are you sleeping with him? I asked again. Because he gives me something I can't get from you, Dave, she replied. I rolled my eyes and sighed in disappointment. Why not consider Ralph's involvement only as his help to me? She asked hopefully. You must be crazy if you think you can convince me otherwise. If that's all you can say, our conversation is over. When I started to leave, she warned me. You can't convince a court of treason without proof. Don't forget that I have a recording that you and Ralph made for me, I reminded him. Are you sure? She asked confidently. A smile appeared on my lips as I headed for the door. It looks like she didn't check the tape she brought from home, not knowing it was empty. Just as I was about to grab the handle of the car door, the sound of clicking heels caught my attention. I turned around and saw Lois half walking, half running in her high heels. I was amazed at how fast she could move on them. She hurried to me out of breath and said, I need to get into the house, Dave. I need my clothes and everything else. Realizing that I was being rude, I couldn't help but respond. Well, it's a pity. It looks like you'll have to wait. I told your lawyer to contact my lawyer and arrange it, I said, getting into the car. I rolled down the window and said goodbye to Lois before driving away. Suddenly she called out to me, Wait, Dave, wait a minute. I could have let her follow me home and pick up my things, but at that moment I just thought, to hell with that woman. If she doesn't have a lawyer yet, it will probably take a day or two. Considering that today was Thursday, I was willing to bet that she would find a lawyer the fastest by Monday. It will take another day to arrange the transportation of her belongings. By then I'll have packed all her things into trash bags without much care. Hopefully she'll have to take everything to the dry cleaners or laundry before she can use them. Did I feel resentment towards Lois? Not at all. My relationship with Lois was only positive. I slept well that night. On Friday, after a busy day at work, I had a leisurely lunch with Myra again. Myra asked about my weekend plans. When I replied that I didn't have any, she suggested, Would you like to spend the weekend with me? I readily agreed but expressed my fear that her husband would find out about it. She assured me that he was going fishing and would not return home until Sunday. From that moment on, I was at her disposal until Sunday afternoon. We planned an evening dinner and dancing, and then spend some time at home to enjoy each other's company. On Saturday evening, dinner and dancing are on the agenda, followed by another intimate evening at home. On Sunday morning, we will continue to love each other until noon, and then we will go to brunch. Does that sound like a good plan? I asked. Everything sounds good except dancing. I think we should spend more time in bed and dance less, Myra said with a laugh. My energy level is different from yours. Sometimes I need a break, I replied, laughing too. Okay, then let's stick to your idea, she agreed. When we parted to go back to work, I said I'd pick her up at 7. When I got home, I found that Lois was wasting no time looking for a lawyer. As I headed into the bedroom to change, I noticed that part of Lois's dressing room was now empty. After looking around the room, I realized that most of her things were no longer there. Curious, I started looking for how it happened. The answer was not long in coming. The window in the family room facing the courtyard was broken. Unfortunately, there was nothing I could do to fix the situation. 
I knew it was useless to call the police if there was no evidence of Lois's guilt. But when I saw the blood on the broken glass, I felt some satisfaction. She must have cut herself during the break-in. Having decided to repair the damage, I searched the yellow pages for a glass company, made an appointment for the next day, and decided to sort out the mess in the morning. Satisfied with my decision, I went upstairs to take a shower and prepare for my date with Myra. We had dinner with pleasure, then danced, drank, and went to bed at 11 o'clock in the evening. I only managed to fall asleep at 3 in the morning and I'll tell you, by the time Myra finished with me I was completely exhausted. I set the alarm for 9 in the morning as the glass company informed me that they would arrive between 10 and 12 o'clock. Fortunately, I didn't have to keep track of the time, as Myra woke me up at 7.20 in the morning in the most delightful way. While I was waiting for the glazier to arrive, I put the broken glass in order and had just finished when he appeared at 10 o'clock 10 minutes. He finished work by 10.40, and by 11, Myra and I were enjoying a late breakfast at Tricochi Restaurant. After the waiter took our order, we sat down and began to enjoy the meal. I asked Myra about her plans for the afternoon. She expressed a desire to spend time together, love and cuddle. I gladly agreed. That's what we did. Our mood was upbeat, and at 5 o'clock we decided to order pizza and continue our leisurely activities that had begun at the beginning of the day. Deciding not to get involved in games on a full stomach, we settled down on the couch and immersed ourselves in the TV for an hour or two. On Sunday morning it dawned on me that her husband was coming back. When I realized this, a question popped into my head, and during a pancake breakfast at the village inn, I asked, How long do I have left with you? Confused, she replied, What do you mean? Are you planning to leave me soon? Surprised, I explained, I just assumed that judging by the way you mentioned flirting with your husband, it was just an accident, not a serious relationship. Maybe, but the decision was never mine. As a rule, the men I had affairs with became possessive and demanded that I leave Harold for them. The problem was that none of them could match Harold's class. None of them could provide me with the luxurious lifestyle I was used to as Harold's wife. The idea of giving up a beautiful house in a beautiful neighborhood and living in a cramped apartment constantly worrying about finances was simply incomprehensible to me. Besides, most of them, like Harold, didn't have a home of their own. At least that's what I thought, she replied. They shouldn't have molested a married woman, and I always wore rings, she said. I don't understand why this is happening. Have you dated other men, knowing full well that they know about your marital status? I asked. Of course, but it wasn't my intention to look for a replacement for Harold. I just wanted revenge. The fact that I kept them close while they were satisfied in bed did not mean that I had sincere feelings for them. Tell me honestly, if they started stalking me, knowing that I was married, would I be able to trust them in a long-term relationship? She asked a question. So I'm just another fling? I asked indignantly. It's just ridiculous. You're not like that at all. I've been working for you for over five years now. And in all that time, you've never shown any romantic interest in me. Remember how we ended up in this situation, my dear. I practically handed you an invitation on a silver platter. You made it clear that you would never pursue a married woman, and you kept your word, she replied. I made an offer, and you wisely accepted it, I explained. If anything happens between us, it's only because you decide to put an end to it yourself. But I assure you, this will not happen in the near future she said. Can we try again before I have to take you home? Her smile was infectious as we drove. That Sunday evening, lying in bed, I felt more content than ever, perhaps even the happiest person in the state or even in the whole district. But on Monday morning, as I was driving to work, thoughts of Myra and our relationship filled my mind, and I realized that the way it was over the weekend couldn't continue. I was in the process of divorcing Lois on the grounds of adultery, and if she decided to go to a lawyer, then I knew that one of their first steps would be to question my relationship with Myra. 
She was looking for a weak spot in me that could be used to her advantage. If she hadn't been able to find a flaw that could be exploited, I would have made a statement about the division of property. If Lois had caught me with Myra, she could have retaliated. But I didn't want to give up on her after waiting so long in a marriage with an unfaithful ex-wife. When I got to work, I called Myra into my office and explained the situation, asking for her advice. She had a few suggestions, but she doubted that I would be able to fulfill them. Let's make some changes. There are three uncomfortable chairs for clients in this room. We should think about adding a comfortable sofa for them to sit on. I can take care of it for you. Since you are often late at work, I will have to stay late to help you too. As soon as we install a new sofa, you can leave, and I'll wait 10 to 15 minutes so that whoever is watching you has enough time to follow you without noticing me. This plan must be effective. Alternatively, I can leave for lunch before you, Myra suggested. Or go to the hotel, check in, and I'll call you to get the room number. As soon as you arrive, go to the second floor where all the conference rooms are located. Then go up the stairs to the floor where our room is located, I suggested. Keep in mind that we cannot do this often, as attending too many conferences may arouse suspicion. To prevent unwanted guests from coming to us, hang a Do Not Disturb sign on the door of one of the conference rooms before they go up the stairs. But this may prove to be an ineffective means of scaring them off, she said. I asked Myra to schedule a conference for the next day, and stressed how important it was that we be seen together. Then I sent her to work and continued the hectic day. It was only at four o'clock that I finally had the opportunity to order a sofa. Without hesitation, I made the payment myself, bypassing all the approvals. By five o'clock, I called Myra to my office and told her that she had to warn her husband that she would be late at work on Thursday. The sofa was supposed to be delivered around noon. How did you manage to work with a hern and accounting so quickly? Myra asked. Actually, I took care of everything myself, I replied. After looking around and making sure no one was listening, she kissed me when the office door closed. I was hoping I wouldn't have to wait until Thursday, she said. I hope you haven't forgotten about tomorrow's conference with the guys from Ajax, I asked. I cursed to myself, realizing that I had completely forgotten about it. Despite this, I was in a great mood all the way home. When I pulled up to the house and noticed Lois parked in the driveway, my good mood quickly evaporated. She parked right in the middle, blocking my way to the garage. I parked next to her to leave her a place to inspect. When I got out of the car, I saw her get out of hers and walk towards me. We need to talk, Dave. Everything is getting out of control, she said. I walked past her and headed for her car. Opening the door, I sat down and took her purse, which she had left on the seat. I emptied the contents onto the seat and turned it upside down. I grabbed her purse, shook out all the money, counted it, put it in my pockets, and threw the purse on the seat along with the rest of my things. You owe me $14 for the broken window, and we don't need to discuss this any further. I've said everything I wanted to say, I said. Dave, I love you and I don't want to get divorced. We can fix everything. It doesn't have to end, she pleaded. No, Lois, we can't be together, I replied categorically. After learning that you betrayed me even before we tied the knot, I came to the conclusion that our relationship is over, Lois. It's over. I was hoping that you would want to talk intelligently about this, but now I understand that you are not capable of it. If you're not in the mood for a divorce, I'm not going to give up without a fight. I will not tolerate infidelity. I am aware of the laws of this state, and I will not agree to the division of property on the principle of 70 to 30, in which I will receive a smaller share. It is unfortunate that you do not consider it necessary to be responsible for your actions towards me, I said menacingly. Adultery remains an accusation, Dave, but you don't have any evidence to back it up. Everything will happen on principle, and I will vehemently deny my guilt. I will claim that you are just trying to extort from me what rightfully belongs to me in our common property. You can even be punished for such unfounded accusations, she vehemently objected. Let's not forget that I have indisputable evidence of your connection with my cousin, I reminded her. 
No, Dave, there is no such evidence. I took this incriminating tape before I left the house and got rid of it, she replied. It will be your word against mine, and without proof, you will lose, she said. Did you destroy her? Ralph will never forgive you. He needed this movie so badly, he might even get mad at you for destroying her. He will stop being interested in you, I said mockingly. Can you understand that I don't care about Ralph? I got what I wanted from him, I don't need him anymore. I need you, she said. I shrugged and reminded her, you still owe me $14 for the window. After which he walked away and headed into the house. She was relentless, unwilling to give up. She pounded on the door and rang the bell for 10 whole minutes before eventually giving up and leaving. I had a smirk on my lips as I watched her walk away down the driveway. She recklessly destroyed the tape without checking its contents. She didn't know yet that she was in for a surprise. I was hoping that she would hire a lawyer and delay the divorce process, spending thousands of dollars, and then discover that I still have evidence. With that thought in mind, I fell asleep that night feeling satisfied. On Tuesday, I successfully held a conference call with the Ajax team, which gave me a positive mood upon returning home. Wednesday went well too. Myra suggested a spontaneous meeting at my desk after work. After making sure we were alone, I agreed, and then reminded her about the late Thursday evening. On the way home I spontaneously decided to go to my favorite restaurant, Landing Strip Lounge, and found that an open mic night was taking place there. Arriving at the place, I hardly found an empty seat in the noisy hall. In the end, a seat at the bar became available and I quickly took it. At that moment, Bobby Denton handed the microphone to a trailer repair mechanic from Triple T Sales and Service in Franktown. This man was known for his intelligence, had degrees in electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. Returning home, he heard an advertisement on the radio, which was recognized as an outright lie. This realization did not leave him until he reached his destination. In his room, he was carefully thinking over the project of a cheating robot. Satisfied with his plan, he went down to the basement workshop to bring it to life. After six weeks of hard work, the robot was finally completed and ready for testing. Coincidentally, as he stood next to the robot in his living room, his 14-year-old son returned home two hours after curfew. When the son was asked why he was late, the boy admitted that he had lost track of time when he was playing cards with friends, the speaker said. After a short break, I finished my beer and went home. The next day brought two pleasant surprises. First, my lawyer informed me that Lois was planning to challenge the divorce, which caused a smirk on my face. Secondly, my black leather sofa was finally delivered. Opting for leather was a wise decision, as I foresaw that I would have to wash off the inevitable stains. Of course, Myra and I left several footprints on him that day. The following weeks passed like a flash. Myra and I made it a rule to meet three or four times a week, usually on the couch after a long day at work. But on three occasions we ended up in a conference room instead. Let's be honest, a bed has always been better than a sofa, just as a sofa is better than a table. Meanwhile, Lois kept calling me almost daily, insisting that she needed me and that I couldn't get out of her arms. Maybe it's time to let go of the past, forget about everything and move forward together? Changing the phone number seemed like an easy solution to stop these constant calls from Lois. I felt an incomprehensible joy telling her about the futility of her efforts, knowing that she had absolutely no idea what was waiting for her. While Ellsworth and Lois's hired lawyer were strategizing, I secretly enjoyed the idea that her lawyer was gaining paid hours and there was no end in sight. Unlike them, I have already negotiated a fixed fee with Ellsworth not caring about the length of the upcoming legal battle. Ellsworth knew about the incriminating tape, but hid it from Lois's legal team. Two lawyers were actively negotiating, and one of them offered Lois to abandon the divorce process if the basis was changed from adultery to irreconcilable differences and an equal division of property was agreed. In an attempt to give Lois some hope, I suggested reducing the size of the section from 70 by 30 to 65 by 35, 
although I understood that she would most likely reject such an offer. Ellsworth informed me that before presenting the case to the judge, he needs to inform the opposing party about the existence of certain records. He warned that the judge would be extremely annoyed if we did not try to come to an agreement before the trial. I've instructed Ellsworth to make his own decision. After all, that's what I hired him for, isn't it? I suspected Lois had told someone about me. I noticed a stranger next to me, whom I did not recognize. He seemed to follow me wherever I went, and I wondered if it was just my paranoia or something more sinister. A week had passed when Ellsworth called me again. Lois and her lawyer wanted to meet this time. I told Ellsworth to make an appointment and let me know the time. He called back and clarified the details. On Friday at 10 in the morning. I arrived early in the morning at 9.30 and discussed the plan with Bert. We agreed that the recording would be ready for the meeting, but I couldn't resist the urge to make fun of Lois one last time. When the meeting began, Lois as usual began to deny the accusations of adultery, claiming that I was being unreasonable. Then I decided to speak out. You continue to ignore the fact that I have a recording of you and my cousin demonstrating questionable behavior, I reported. Actually, no. You don't have any evidence to back up your claim and you know it perfectly well, Lois replied. Here's my suggestion, Lois. If you sign the papers immediately, I am ready to consider the option of dividing the property 60 by 40. This offer is only valid for the next two minutes. If you refuse, I believe that the decision on the division of property will be made by the judge, I said. I'm not going to agree to this, Dave. You have no proof, she said with a smirk. Yes, Lois, I have records of your relationship with Ralph, I replied. Lois did exactly what I expected. She got angry and opened her mouth. Damn it, Dave! I already told you that I got rid of the film! Oh? So you admit that you committed adultery and then destroyed the evidence? Her eyes widened as she realized her mistake. No, that's not what I meant. Forget about it, Lois. I tried to give you a chance, but as always, your stubbornness prevented you. Let the court make the decision, Lois's lawyer firmly stated. If you have evidence, present it now. I signaled to Ellsworth, who walked over to the VCR at the end of the table. This is your last chance, Lois. I agree to an agreement in the amount of 60-40, but after pressing the play button, the offer will be cancelled, and we will go to court. Lois blushed. Go to hell, Dave! You have nothing against me! See you in court, Lois, I said, and left the room. As I was leaving the building, the phone rang. It was Bert offering a deal. I refused. I offered Lois an easy way out of the situation, but she refused, and now everything was going as usual. Ignoring the growing number of calls from Lois, I turned off my home phone and made sure Myra knew not to transfer calls from her to me. Now Lois could only contact me on her cell phone. I saved the phone and the number, just to make fun of her. I was amused by the numerous calls from her, which I deliberately ignored. Myra was overloading me more than I could handle in my life, but I wasn't going to make any claims. Three days after the meeting with Lois and the lawyers, Myra came up to me with a serious expression on her face and said, We have an important question, a very serious one. Panic seized me. Her husband must have found out about our affair. How serious is he? I asked nervously. It's very bad, she replied. My husband will be at home all week except for one day. It's not normal, is it? And how will we spend this time together? She asked. After thinking about it, I came up with a plan. You can leave work half an hour before me and go to my house. Park a block away from the house and then go inside and make sure all the curtains and blinds are tightly closed. When I get home, we can have some fun. I will set off in the morning and if someone follows me, they will lead me astray. Just wait 10 to 15 minutes to make sure I'm okay before you get out and go to work, I replied. We will wait until the weekend, and then we will develop a new plan. How about we spend the weekend together? Myra asked. I'll stick to my usual routine during the week, but on Friday, when you get home, we'll stay at the house for the whole weekend, I replied happily. 
Do you think you can spend two and a half days with me? What is it? She asked playfully. I'm not sure I can handle two and a half days with you, my love, but we won't know until we try, I replied with a laugh. So we tried and I got through the weekend successfully. This weekend has been extremely enjoyable. At the end of the evening, I felt a little melancholy when Myra went home to her husband. I was already used to her presence and enjoyed our time together. But I also knew that soon I would have to look for someone new to fill the void left by my impending divorce from Lois. I longed for the companionship and connection that comes with marriage. I longed for a full-fledged relationship in which I could feel confident falling asleep in the arms of a woman who would be next to me when I woke up in the morning. I can easily imagine a similar relationship with Myra, but she never explicitly said that she would leave Harold. It seemed to me that she was pleased with him, except for his tendency to criticize her, and was willing to stay with him as long as he reciprocated her feelings. I remembered the list she shared with me at the beginning of our romance, and mentally reviewed it. There were three women mentioned, but none of them seemed suitable to me as a life partner. Two of them smoked, which I didn't do, and I knew I couldn't get along with them. When I was growing up my parents both smoked a lot, two packs a day. As a result, our house constantly stank of stale tobacco, the smell penetrated into every corner. The only exception was Liz from accounting, who was the only non-smoker among us. Despite her beauty, I never thought about a romantic relationship with her because of our age difference. One day I went to her office to discuss an expense report, but I was greeted by the sound of rap music, which I couldn't stand. As I drove to work on Monday, I couldn't help but think about how much fun it would be to chat with Liz, even though I knew it wouldn't last long. When I arrived at work, I was too busy with my own affairs to think about personal things. I was so busy that I had to decline when Myra asked if we were going to have lunch. Before leaving, Bert Ellsworth called and said that Lois desperately needed a solution to the problem. I knew I had to decide this for you, he said. I suggest you offer her a 60-40 share so that she signs the agreement immediately. Although adultery often leads to an increase in the proportion of the injured party, there is a possibility that the judge will propose to divide 50 by 50, regardless of the circumstances. Perhaps it would be wiser to conclude an agreement to avoid uncertainty, he said. After some thought I recommend offering her a share of 65 to 35 and see if she agrees. During the break, Myra came to the office and complained, I didn't get my long lunch, can I at least lie on the couch for a while? I let her do it. At 10 a.m. the next day, Ellsworth called and said that Lois had accepted the offer of a share of 6535. He mentioned that she would come on Wednesday at 5 to sign the papers and asked for a short meeting with me. I didn't see any point in it, except for the opportunity to be sarcastic about her again but I agreed to a meeting to get it over with. I promised Bertha that I would come at 2 o'clock to discuss the meeting she had requested. When we arrived at the conference room, I settled into an armchair and waited patiently for her to speak. Sensing my silence, she took a deep breath and confessed. I don't want this, Dave. I know you may not believe it, but I love you. Can't we find a way to deal with this and stay together? I shook my head and answered firmly. No, Lois. Not after I found out how long you've been lying to me. I have to be honest with you. If you had a short-term affair with someone, I might be able to get over it. Maybe you had a few affairs before we tied the knot, and then you were faithful to me for many years, until one of those past affairs resurfaced and you made a short-term mistake that I can still forgive. But a long-term affair before we committed ourselves to each other? No way, Lois. This is something that I cannot accept. Do you claim that you hardly love a guy, but at the same time you give him your love, while the person you claim to love may not feel this love from you for weeks or even months? It's wrong, Lois. It's just wrong, I said. Is that all? Is that all you can say? Come on, Dave, please give us a chance, she asked. I can't do this, Lois. I'll never be able to trust you again, and I can't live like this. I got up and headed for the door. Looking back, I told her, You're a beautiful woman, Lois, 
so I'm sure you won't be alone for long. If you find someone else, I hope they treat you as badly as you treated me. With that, I left the room. I found a place at the bar and was soon greeted by Karen, who put a beer in front of me with a smile. Where have you been hiding, handsome? What is it? She asked. I sighed, admitting that I was going through a divorce and was not in the mood for communication. I just decided to come in for a beer or two and relax, I explained. Karen raised an eyebrow, teasingly asking if my newfound bachelor status meant she could finally try to win me over with her charms. I thought you were ready. I've been flirting with you for years, and you've always brushed me off by talking about how good you feel with your boyfriend. I grinned. I thought he and I were serious, but it turned out to be a mistake, she replied. Feeling satisfied, I asked Karen to bring me the check. When she accepted the payment and returned with the change, she smiled at me and said, Don't forget about me when your divorce is finalized, okay? I nodded. I won't forget. Take care of yourself. I returned home slowly, feeling surprisingly inspired. Who would have thought that Karen was interested in me? The divorce will be over soon, as soon as Lois signs the papers. Despite the expected decision, I felt ready to move on. This meant that I would no longer be overwhelmed by the fear of being under surveillance. Myra and I could finally stop hiding our actions. When Myra suggested we go for a long lunch around 10 in the morning, I agreed. But I assured her that there was no need to book a room for us to avoid possible consequences. Lois had signed the papers the day before so there was no longer a need to anticipate a scenario that might never come to fruition. We went to the Marriott around 11.30 in the morning. Upon entering the room, we excitedly jumped on the bed. While we were packing, Myra asked, What's next? I was taken aback by her question but quickly replied, As long as you need me, I'll be here. Eventually I'll be looking for a wife. I liked being married. Then Myra asked, what qualities would you like to see in your wife? She should be beautiful, love me, be strong enough to tolerate me and cook well, I listed with a grin. I can cook delicious food, she said. I stared at her for a second or two, until it dawned on me what she was really saying. If you are suitable for this role, I will move your candidacy to the top of the list. But there is one small condition. I will not be a backup participant. I said. She looked at me with a confused expression on her face, and then it dawned on her. Don't worry, dear. Harold may not realize it yet, but he will soon be a thing of the past, she assured me with a smile. Suddenly it dawned on me, and Myra noticed a change in my behavior. Worried, she asked, What's bothering you, dear? What's on your mind? We've finally reached the point where we don't have to hide from Lois, but now we have to keep secrets from Harold while we go through the divorce process, I replied. Well, I have a feeling that this won't be necessary. I intend to offer him a choice between adultery and irreconcilable differences, she said. I have enough evidence to support the accusations of adultery, and if I decide to go down this path and threaten to make the case public, he will most likely agree to a divorce due to irreconcilable differences. Harold is steadily moving up the career ladder and aspires to become a vice president. But the CEO and some members of the company's board of directors are Christian believers. Revealing Harold's infidelity could jeopardize his chances of promotion. Although it may turn out to be a temporary stay in a motel for me, we can handle this situation, right? She asked. Myra's carefully thought out plan turned out to be exactly what she had imagined and she did not waste time on decisive action. On my recommendation, she quickly contacted Ellsworth and arranged a meeting on Friday. She instructed Bert to prepare two sets of documents, one on adultery, the other on irreconcilable differences. At 11.45 on Saturday, just before the bank closed, she withdrew half the money from her checking account, emptied her savings, and took four of the six CDs from the safe. When she returned home, she packed her things and went to bed. Harold went to try his luck at the casino, won a large sum of gold coins, which he immediately hid in the car, and by three o'clock checked into a motel room. Back at home, Myra cooked a meal, uncorked a bottle of wine, and sat down to dinner with Harold. 
It was then that she gave out a sensation. She found out about his numerous affairs, hired private detectives to collect evidence on three of them, and reached the limit. She informed Harold that she was filing for divorce and told him that she had already taken action on the money he had won. She offered Harold to give her his share of the house, considering it more than fair, given that her contribution was more than the bank loan she took out. Handing him the divorce papers, she outlined the possible options and gave him until 10 o'clock on Monday morning to make a decision. Grinning, she left the house, leaving Harold with the dirty dishes. Without hesitation, Harold called her on her cell phone and chose the path of irreconcilable differences. On Wednesday, they met at Bert's office, where Harold signed the papers. Myra decided to stay at the motel for the weekend to let the situation calm down. After she moved in with me, we planned to live together until our divorces were settled legally, and then we were going to tie the knot. But when we reached this milestone, a new obstacle arose. Myra was doing well in her career and did not want to give up her position. Unfortunately, our employer had a strict policy prohibiting relatives from working in one place. Although both of us could have stayed at work, one of us would have had to transfer to another institution. The nearest option was 90 miles away, and this prospect did not suit us at all. We decided to deceive the company by not disclosing our marital status. Myra insisted on keeping her last name and health insurance. We planned to continue this farce until we were discovered, and then Myra would quit and look for a new job. However, she didn't have to work because my job paid well. Myra moved in with me on Sunday after she checked out of the motel, and the next two months passed without problems. Over time I began to relax and weaken my defenses. I made a big mistake by constantly answering Lois's calls just to blow her off. I should have known she wouldn't give up so easily. On Wednesday evening, Myra and I were at our favorite bar and enjoyed a drink. We didn't always go there on Wednesdays, but this evening was special because one of the accounting girls was going to perform. We were ready to support and encourage Shelly in her quest for show business, but Myra and I thought her current job was more suitable for her. Shelly began her performance with a joke about how her wife hit a man on the head with a frying pan after she found a piece of paper with another woman's name in his pocket. Last week while at the racetrack I placed a bet on a horse named Jenny. While I was watching the races my wife apologized for interrupting me and returned to household chores. But three days later while I was watching TV, my wife suddenly came up to me and hit me on the head with a large frying pan, which made me lose consciousness. When I came to my senses, I asked her why she hit me again. Your horse called, she replied with a grin. The speaker was speaking. The crowd around us giggled politely as she continued her playful antics. An elderly man and a woman have been married for countless years, but they disliked each other. Their disagreements often escalated into heated arguments that lasted into the night. The old man often threatened his wife, shouting, Even in death, I will rise from the grave to torment you forever. Because of such attacks, the neighbors trembled with fear and were sure that he was practicing the dark arts, because unusual things were happening in their neighborhood. The old man liked to inspire fear in others. At the age of 85, the old man died of a heart attack. His wife's funeral was held in a closed coffin, and after the burial she decided to unwind and have fun at a local bar. Worried neighbors questioned her safety. Was she afraid that her late husband would return and haunt her? Without wasting a second, the wife replied confidently, Let him try to dig himself out. I buried this old fart upside down, and I know he won't stop to ask for directions. Our accountant joked from the stage. Myra laughed as she continued to enjoy her drink. As I said, everything was going smoothly, but she knew she had to hold on to her job. The new comedian was just imagining the following picture, when he suddenly felt splashes of something wet on himself and heard a woman scream, Get your hands off my man, garbage! Turning around, I saw Lois standing behind us and pouring a drink over Myra's head. Before I could react, Myra threw her drink in Lois's face in response. Lois tripped and fell to the floor, and I quickly grabbed Myra and led her out the door. I had a few rags in the car that I could use to wipe it off. I had just finished helping Myra dry off when Lois jumped out of the door, 
clearly unsteady on her feet after hitting her nose with a beer bottle. To my surprise, she was helped by none other than my obnoxious cousin Ralph. Anger boiled up in me as I watched him help her, and without thinking, I dropped the rag from my hands and shouted, You're despicable jerk! rushed at him. Ralph let go of Lois, causing her to fall to the ground and started running. I chased him for three blocks but eventually gave up and returned to the parking lot. When I pulled up, I found that Myra had pinned Lois to the fender of the car. As I approached the two women, I noticed that Lois was in tears and Myra was yelling at her. Understand, you idiot! I didn't steal it from you! You threw it and I accidentally caught it! Myra screamed. When Myra saw me, she walked away from Lois and offered, Let's leave! Get in the car! I need to talk to Joe and fix this, I replied. Josh Lambert is the owner of the place and was most likely very angry at our prank. When I entered the hall, I found Joe and asked if repairs were needed. He grinned and assured me that there was no damage. Next time, do it during the intermission so that visitors have something to look at when no one is talking into the microphone, he joked. When I got out, Lois met me at the entrance, and Myra waited patiently in the car. Lois came up to me begging, Please, Dave, give up the divorce. It's hard for me. I need you. I love you, and I believe that we can work this out. Lois, you're probably the stupidest person in the world. Telling me you love me after cheating is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And to top it all off, you didn't pay attention to the fact that the whole room was looking at us. You need to move on, Lois. The only emotions I have for you are hatred and disgust. Please leave me alone. I said contemptuously. I walked past her, got into the car and drove away. Both divorces were finalized and I proposed to Myra. Let's come back to this issue in a year, dear. By that time we will have a better understanding of whether life together is really suitable for us, she said, stunning me with this news. After waiting a year I asked the question again, and she agreed. We both wanted to avoid another extravagant wedding, so we opted for a simple civil ceremony at the Justice of the Peace. Lois and Ralph tied the knot, but unfortunately, less than two years later, their marriage broke up. It turned out that Ralph had been cheating with several women, which led to disastrous consequences for Lois. It became clear that infidelity was the reason for the breakup of their relationship. For Lois, cheating was a completely different story and she didn't tolerate betrayal. Ralph infected Lois with AIDS, which made her desperate. She overreacted to this and closed herself off from everyone. She just went to work and returned home, while not talking to anyone and not having fun at all. Psychological trauma greatly affected her life. She stopped being attractive and well-groomed, but on the contrary, gained weight and dressed like an old grandmother. After six years of marriage to Myra, Ralph made the mistake of attending a wedding that I attended, and I kept my promise to him. Perhaps it will take a little time and I will be accepted at another family event. Oh no, oh no, oh no! Matt realized that he had just made a grave mistake in his career, and now the boss of the company demands his immediate presence. With a sinking feeling in his stomach, he got up from his desk and headed for Dan Connor's office. His mind was spinning with excitement. There was no way Dan could have known about what had happened. Being both an accountant and CEO, Matt was the only one who was privy to all the intricacies of the company's financial operations. And as far as he knew, by the end of each month, all the bills were in order. Matt felt beads of sweat form on his forehead as he hesitantly knocked on the door. He tried to calm his nerves by reminding himself that Dan rarely bothered to scrutinize confusing financial statements unless there were glaring errors in the figures. Dan was too preoccupied with his luxurious lifestyle, expensive cars, and endless pursuit of women. Dan entered the room and motioned for Matt to sit down, his expression serious. Matt's false sense of security evaporated instantly. I guess the main question is, how long have you been cheating on me? Dan's words hit Matt like a brick, making his head swim with panic. I have no idea what you're talking about, he said, 
denying any wrongdoing until Dan presented transaction logs showing that a large amount of money went through one of Matt's personal accounts and was then returned to the company. Caught in the act, Matt confessed, I'm sorry, Dan. I just needed a temporary loan until the loan company contacted me. We would have lost the new house that Susan wanted. I didn't steal it. I paid it off quickly before the end of the month. I'm not sure if they consider it theft or fraud, Matt, but the consequences are serious. You could get a prison sentence and lose your job. I trusted you, but now I'm not sure I can trust you anymore, Den said. Please give me a chance to explain everything. It was a mistake in reasoning. I have been devoted to this company for almost two decades and have never crossed this line before. I promise it won't happen again, Matt begged. Dan stood by the window lost in thought. You and Susan have been my longtime friends, which only adds to the frustration of this situation. Did Susan know about your actions? The question caught Matt off guard, because it was actually Susan's idea. She was so afraid of losing the house that she suggested the idea to Matt, promising that no one would ever know the truth. Matt believed that by involving Susan, Dan might not report the incident to the authorities, but he did not dare to involve her in this case. After some thought, he simply replied, No. She didn't know it was my idea. Dan seemed shocked by Matt's response, but waved it off. I need time to think about it, Matt. I do not know what is the best way to proceed. Go home and don't come back until the end of the week. I'll make a decision by Friday. As Matt walked home, he couldn't figure out how Dan found out about this. No one discussed the deal, and Dan wasn't privy to the details. He was most concerned about which option Dan would choose in the end. None of the proposed options seemed tempting to him, but the fear of a trial and possible imprisonment led him into a state of panic. He knew perfectly well that Susan would not be waiting for him to return. Looking at their newly purchased house, he couldn't help but feel deeply regret that he had bought this place in the first place. Memories flashed through my head of stories in which a man, returning home, found his wife in the midst of an affair. Could such a scenario mean the end of a day that was supposed to be perfect? But when he went into the kitchen, he was relieved to find Susan there, cheerful and well-dressed as always. He was delighted with her beauty again. At forty, she exuded elegance and grace. Her luxurious curls cascaded over her deep brown eyes, framing her face. He couldn't help but notice how her figure had grown prettier over the years, with more curves and cleavage than when they first exchanged vows. But what really won him over was her smile, which he knew he would miss in the coming days. Matt recounted his conversation with Dan and presented the evidence he had gathered, looking forward to Susan's reaction. Oh dear, I'm sorry, it's all because of me. This whole mess was my idea, all for the sake of this ridiculous house, she said bitterly. Matt sighed. I warned Dan that you are not involved in this. There's no point in both of us getting into trouble, Matt replied. Maybe I'll try to talk to him and explain, Susan asked. Matt thought about it, but eventually suggested they just wait. He knew that the next three days would be agonizing. If Dan decides to go for the kill, they can try to beg. Matt couldn't help but wonder what he would have done in Dan's place. They were friends, socialized outside the office, and often attended parties together. Perhaps this connection opened up small opportunities for him. Dan sent a message saying that he would come to their house at 7 o'clock on Friday evening. Matt and Susan were looking forward to his arrival. Dan arrived in his Aston Martin as planned. Matt thought, a man who seems to have everything, looks, wealth, charisma, and now the ability to destroy it all. Dan was led forward, greeted with forced smiles, and Susan, as always, handed him a beer. Before he could respond, Matt intervened. I just want to apologize, Dan. I know I screwed up a lot and let you down. I have put myself in a difficult position and I'm ready for any consequences. Dan smiled strangely in response. I hope you're serious, Matt. The silence that followed seemed to last forever, until Dan finally spoke. I have to admit I envy your relationship with Susan, Matt. I miss that kind of connection in my life, Dan suddenly said. Matt was stunned by Dan's confession. 
He had always believed that Dan had everything, including an endless parade of attractive girlfriends. Perhaps approaching the age of 30, Dan wanted to settle down. Considering this, I have a suggestion. It may not be ideal for each of you, but it's the only solution that can keep you out of jail, Matt, and it's important to consider the potential risks to Susan, he said. Since the account was shared and was used to buy a house in both your names, I know that you would not have taken such action without her approval, he added. Matt felt a surge of panic at the thought of Susan having to face the consequences. He didn't know what the consequences might be. Dan took a deep breath before speaking. It's hard to say, but I suggest spending time with Susan. There was a shocked silence in the room. Dan explained, no law enforcement intervention, no court proceedings or imprisonment. You can continue your work and stay together. I'll be spending every Friday night with her, he added. Dan, are you serious? Matt whispered. Yes, Dan replied firmly. I've wanted Susan for so long and I can't miss this chance. There must be another solution. We can offer more money anything, but... Susan began to say, before Dan interrupted her. This is the only way out for you. I've been told that I look good. I hope it's not too difficult for you, he said. Maybe when everything calms down, the situation won't be so unpleasant for each of us, Den suggested. We need time to think things through. Making such a decision on the spot is unwise, Susan said. Matt turned to Susan with an expression of disbelief on his face. You can't really think about it, baby. Are you crazy? Susan sighed. Matt... We've been racking our brains for days trying to find another solution. I don't see any other way out, honey. Matt flushed with anger and looked at Dan. You are a despicable excuse for a man. This idea is perverted and wrong. Dan smiled back at Matt and then turned to Susan. Matt may think I'm a bastard, but I know I'm not. And you shouldn't waste time trying to figure it out, he said firmly. After a heated argument that lasted 15 minutes... Dan stood up decisively. It's time to make a decision. I'm either going to the car or going upstairs with Susan, he announced, holding out his hand to her with a smile. Susan hesitated for a moment before finally taking his hand. Matt leaned back in his chair, stunned by Susan's words. We have no other choice, she said calmly, assuring him that everything would be fine. She then led Dan through the living room and up the stairs, leaving Matt in a state of shock. Time seemed to stand still as Matt took in what had just happened. There was an eerie silence in the room, and the weight of the conversation hung in the air. Thoughts of what was happening upstairs raced through his mind. He could hear faint movements and murmuring voices, and then he distinctly heard someone settling down on the bed. The reality of the situation hit him like a brick, and he felt depressed and unsure of what to expect next. The silent minutes dragged on, seemed like hours. Eventually a faint creak broke through the silence, heralding the beginning of the intimacy of two people. The sounds of their actions became louder and clearer. The rhythm of the creaking of the bed coincided with the muffled moans that filled the room. The intensity increased, the sounds became faster and clearer. It seemed endless, making Matt doubt his sanity. A sense of shame and guilt overwhelmed him, and he wiped away tears, anticipating Dan and Susan's return downstairs. But the quiet conversations and movements continued, and Matt felt worried and didn't know what to do next. After a long silence, Matt got up from his seat with a sudden desire to make sure that Susan was all right. Listening carefully, he heard the unmistakable creak of the bed again. As he headed for the stairs, he caught snatches of Dan's voice in conversation. But what really struck him was Susan's incessant whimpering, accompanied by quiet wailing and moaning. Unable to bear this unsettling atmosphere any longer, Matt realized that he had to leave the house. Hurriedly leaving the house, he walked aimlessly down the street. Was Susan really enjoying herself, or was she just pretending in front of Dan? He couldn't help but wonder how serious her objections were. The thought that Dan was ten years younger and more beautiful did not leave him. But as he walked towards the park, his gaze changed. Susan's actions were motivated by a desire to protect him from trouble with the law. 
Realizing this he hurried back to the house to ensure her safety. The Aston Martin remained parked on the street, but when he went inside, the house became eerily quiet. On his way to the kitchen he reached for a beer. Turning around, he was surprised to find Susan standing there in a short robe. They exchanged a confused look before Matt could ask, Are you okay? Susan smiled faintly and assured him, Yes, thanks for asking. She hesitated, and then added, He's just being polite, nothing out of the ordinary. I'm sorry if you overheard something. Matt shrugged, relieved that it was over. But Susan looked awkward when she confessed. Actually, he wants to come again. My throat was dry, so I took a beer and decided to see how you were doing, Matt said. Why don't you go to the room? It'll make you feel better and it's probably quieter there. Try to figure out how to fix this, Susan said. Matt sat in the room for another hour, but couldn't find a solution. Suddenly he heard footsteps approaching. As he stepped out into the hallway, he saw Dan trying to hide a smile before addressing Matt in this tense atmosphere. I know it's hard for you, Matt. I assure you I will always treat Susan with the utmost respect. I am incredibly grateful to you for giving me the opportunity to spend time with her. Please take care of yourself and be sure that any work issues will remain a secret between us, Dan said. In response, Matt humbly replied, You're welcome, because you left us no other choice. Both Matt and Susan looked worried, signaling that it was time for Dan to leave. To Matt's surprise, when Dan was saying goodbye to him, Susan unexpectedly kissed him on the cheek. It wasn't a passionate kiss, but it was a lingering touch on his lips. Matt barely had time to react before Dan disappeared. He turned to Susan, a look of confusion on his face. What was that? The realization of her mistake hit Susan like a brick. What? It was just a goodbye kiss. Matt shook his head. No, it was more than that. It was a gesture of affection. I think you had a good time and I shouldn't have worried so much. Susan flushed with anger at these words. I can't believe your boss took advantage of me three times because of what you did and all you're worried about is a goodbye kiss, Susan exclaimed. It was supposed to be a simple agreement, just making love. Did you really kiss him upstairs? Matt asked. Well, maybe a little, but not much, she replied. At first, it was only a few times, then, as I heard, you liked it, and now you're being petted, Matt protested. Susan, feeling guilty, exclaimed, it's not like that. All I'm doing is protecting us from getting caught and going to jail. It will require both of us to be open-minded and ensure he has a good time. We both need to adjust to the new situation. If I can handle it, then you have to find a way to handle it, she added. Matt felt depressed after that last remark. Despite the fact that he disapproved of Susan's choice, it was her who had to sacrifice, not him. She could have easily walked away, leaving him to deal with the consequences alone. He knew he couldn't sleep in the master bedroom, haunted by what had happened there. So they settled on the guest room. Susan and Matt snuggled up to each other. Susan quickly fell asleep from fatigue, but Matt did not sleep. His thoughts were in constant turmoil. He was desperately looking for a way out of a difficult situation. They hardly spoke for the next week. Their only conversations revolved around how to escape. Matt considered various plans, most of which turned out to be useless. And even when he came up with an acceptable solution, it seemed that Dan was always one step ahead. One of the proposals suggested erasing all traces of evidence, but it turned out that Dan had denied him access to backups and insisted that all financial data be securely stored in a new cloud system. Next Friday, Dan texted Matt saying that he planned to invite Susan to dinner, claiming that this would help resolve the situation. Matt wasn't sure if a date would really make things easier. It seemed that this could lead to a closer relationship, but at the same time it was questionable. By spending less time in bed with Susan, he ended up in a difficult situation. Susan seemed to be very upset about their date, but she was preparing for it anyway. Matt thought she had put in too much effort and looked too stunning when Dan arrived to ask her out. Seeing her in a stylish black dress and high heels getting into Dan's fancy car was heartbreaking. The following night became even more difficult for him. He sent Susan several messages to check on how she was feeling. 
Each time he received only brief answers in which she said that she was fine, she was just having dinner or just drinking. It wasn't until 10 o'clock that they finally returned. Dan hugged Susan as they entered the house, both laughing and in high spirits. Matt looked around and noticed that Susan was having a great time again and looked pretty drunk. We didn't agree that you would be dating, Matt said. Dan calmed him down by saying, Relax, Matt. It was just a dinner and a drink between friends. It's going to be uncomfortable for me. Maybe it's better to get it over with right away, Matt grumbled. What do you mean, immediately? Dan asked, his smile returning. We have a deal for every Friday, Matt. So I'm going to sleep with Susan tonight, and I'm sure you can do it in the spare room, Dan explained. Despite the fact that Susan was drunk, she felt the tension between the two men and was afraid that Matt might lash out at Dan. She quickly led him into the kitchen, whispering, It's going to be okay, honey. I'll deal with it quickly, and then I'll pretend to be drunk and go to bed. Matt accepted that they had no other choice. With a heavy heart, he left, consumed by a deep sense of helplessness. As they climbed the stairs, Susan's laughter echoed through the house, and Matt wondered if it was meant for Dan or for himself. Exhausted and defeated, Matt eventually found solace in a spare bedroom for the night. Every time he woke up from a nap, the creaking of the bed in the next room reminded him of the mess of his emotions. The next morning, as Matt walked down the stairs, he came to terms with the reality of their situation. Dan was already sitting at the table and watching Susan prepare breakfast. He has reached the limit of his abilities. Get lost, Dan. It's not Friday anymore and your hospitality here has expired, Matt stated. Susan tried to defuse the situation by saying, Don't be rude, Matt. Let's try to be polite. But Matt interrupted her with a final warning to Dan. You have ten seconds to leave my territory. Dan seemed about to object but changed his mind and got up to leave. As he headed for the door, he couldn't resist one last barb. Don't forget what's at stake here, Matt, he warned before leaving. Matt looked at Susan, raising an eyebrow. Should I make him breakfast? Seriously? Why not just move in with him at this point? You look more like his wife than mine, he remarked, then hurriedly left the room, leaving Susan speechless. Dan suggested they stay at the hotel on the third Friday to avoid conflicts with Matt. Susan, dressed in her usual outfit, left at six in the evening believing that it would be less difficult for Matt. She was supposed to change into something more appropriate at the hotel while Dan was waiting for her at the restaurant. In the luxury of the hotel, Susan felt out of place in casual clothes. She was surprised to discover that the room they had booked was actually a suite, which further increased her sense of awe. There was a beautiful bouquet of flowers on the table, and two elegantly packed boxes lay on the bed. Curious, she opened a large box and found a stunning silver satin dress with a plunging neckline and a bold slit. The second box contained a matching red satin corset, a thong, and luxurious black stockings. She was hesitant at first, but decided to try them on anyway, and to her surprise, they fit her perfectly. Admiring herself in the mirror, she felt incredibly impressive and confident. She decided not to take off her underwear and went to the restaurant. Dan greeted her, amazed at how beautiful Susan turned out to be. The dinner and wine that followed were delicious. There was tension in the air, anticipating what was about to happen. In Dan's presence, Susan felt at ease and decided not to resist, but to accept the situation. Back in the room, Susan felt Dan slowly and sensually take off her clothes, enjoying the way he appreciated her underwear. His fingers danced over every curve of her body, sending shivers of pleasure down her spine. The corset accentuated her ample breasts and graceful hips, making her feel sexy and desirable. The feel of the silky stockings on her skin was luxurious, and she couldn't get enough of it. Dan was a passionate and attentive lover. His touch was both caring and brave. There was a hint of danger in his eyes that aroused her in a way her husband had never aroused. The morning after their passionate encounter, Susan changed into her casual clothes, 
knowing she couldn't risk bringing home any evidence of her forbidden relationship with Dan. Dan agreed to keep the items at his home so that Susan could use them in the future. Susan sighed, realizing that this agreement would be long-term. Emotions overwhelmed her, and she tried to figure out how she felt about the current situation. Guilt weighed on her, but she couldn't ignore the feeling of anticipation and satisfaction. By 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, Matt was still awake, waiting for Susan to return. She broke their agreement again. He doubted very much that Dan would be able to resist being around Susan again this morning, and he was afraid that she wouldn't even try to avoid this situation. Despite his best efforts not to give up, his faith in Susan was running out. If he continued to lose confidence in her, it could mean the end of their marriage. He felt even more distant from Susan than ever before, and felt incredibly isolated. That ill-fated kiss had led to a rift between them that seemed insurmountable. This had upset Matt a lot, and now breakfast with Dan loomed ahead, reminding him of his poor judgment. What was he thinking? She began to seriously doubt the whole situation. From her point of view, spending time with Dan was much easier than she had imagined. He was attractive and brought an element of excitement into her life. Money and fancy cars didn't hurt either. She had always dreamed of a more luxurious lifestyle. However, the problem was that the passion she shared with Dan was strong. Too strong. She had to constantly fight against impulses and resist the irresistible desire for more. She hoped Matt would eventually come to his senses and look at the situation from her point of view. But after three weeks, his sullenness persisted, and she felt out of place. She was consumed by a deep desire to make love to him. But they hadn't crossed that line yet. She really wanted to change this, as she loved him very much, and regretted the situation. She tried to sort out her feelings with Matt, assuring him that she was doing a great job and he shouldn't blame himself. She even mentioned that Dan was kind to her, but it was purely a physical affection that could not replace the love she felt for Matt. Despite the fact that she was trying to convey her thoughts to him, Matt looked depressed and distant. His constant presence in her life now turned into a fading memory. When Dan arrived at work on Monday, he told Matt that he had to go to a training session out of town on Wednesday and Thursday next week. Matt was hesitant at first, but because of the situation at work, he reluctantly agreed. I agree, but to be clear, it doesn't change anything in our personal relationship. You won't be able to come when I'm not at home, Matt said. Dan assured him, of course not. Later that evening, when Matt informed Susan about the trip, she didn't look shocked or worried. Such courses were held infrequently, only once or twice a year. It all seemed too perfect to Matt. He headed for the kitchen, intending to figure out how to get out of the predicament he found himself in, but his plans were thwarted by a throbbing headache. As he was climbing the stairs in search of painkillers, he heard Susan talking on the phone. Curious, he listened to her conversation, wondering who she was talking to. Why are you sending Matt on a trip? No, this is an unwise decision. The situation is already difficult and your participation will only complicate everything even more. No, he hasn't come up with a solution yet. He seems to have accepted defeat and feels defeated. I did not expect such an outcome. He's heartbroken. Despite the fact that it was my suggestion, I did not expect his violent reaction. The plan was designed so that we could safely spend time together without fear of being caught. I never imagined that it would turn out this way, she said. I kissed you at breakfast, and you were being arrogant and grinning in his face. You can come during his trip, but we may have to limit our interaction or stop it altogether. If you propose to terminate this agreement because of its effect on Matt, you will be considered a good person, and we can return to normal life. Maybe if we're careful, we can still see each other sometimes. We'll discuss this later, but right now my first priority is to establish a relationship with Matt. She said quietly into the phone. No matter what, I still love him. She ended the conversation. Matt struggled down the stairs, and the full weight of the situation hit him like a physical blow. He could not comprehend the consequences of what he had just heard. 
Now it became clear why Dan was always one step ahead. Susan had been providing him with information all this time. It was her idea to borrow the money, and she convinced Matt to do it against his instincts. Now it became clear how Dan even found out about the error. The secret was so well hidden that he doubted that even a thorough check would be able to uncover it. Despite the fact that he was married to a holy woman who protected him from trouble, he could not get rid of the feeling that his other half was actually a lying and unreliable person. Vindictive and cruel thoughts assailed him, but he knew that he had to remain calm and think logically. He devised a plan to make them question his behavior, hoping to uncover the truth. Avoiding Susan for the rest of the night and the next morning, Matt considered his next move. When he saw Susan on Tuesday evening, he decided not to bring up the subject of the overheard conversation. Instead, he mentioned that he had heard Dan brag at work that he had a high-class woman. Matt hoped Dan hadn't mentioned Susan. The next morning Matt went on a trip, and Susan confessed her love to him. He smiled briefly and pretended to be concerned, checking the schedule on his phone before leaving. On Wednesday morning, Dan showed up at Susan's, and she didn't waste time asking about the bragging incident. Despite Dan's denial and his accusations against Matt of causing problems, Susan didn't know who to believe. She couldn't understand why Matt would make up such a story, but she began to doubt that Dan was not as careful as she had first thought, which created a potential problem. During the intimacy, Susan and Dan discussed the current situation and considered possible solutions. Susan realized that the emotional connection she shared with Matt was missing from her relationship with Dan, which was purely physical. Despite her doubts, Dan managed to convince Susan to extend their romance until his departure on Thursday afternoon. Susan firmly stated that this would be the last time until her relationship with Matt improved. When they left the house, Dan froze in shock at the sight before him. A sharp kitchen knife lay threateningly on the hood of his Aston Martin. He looked around the area but saw no one. To his horror, all four tires were cut. Hurriedly returning to the house, Dan informed Susan about the unpleasant discovery. They both panicked that Matt might have returned home earlier than expected. He had to be the culprit, unless it was naughty kids or someone envious of a luxury car. This was not the first case of vandalism. Susan called Matt to ask how the class was going. He calmly replied that everything went without incident and began to prepare for departure. He didn't mention Dan and spoke calmly. Susan expressed her excitement about meeting him and quickly ended the conversation. She later recounted the conversation to Dan, noting that Matt didn't look upset. Maybe it's the neighbors. Anyway, they needed to tow the car before Matt got home. As a result of the situation, several frantic calls and expensive payments followed. When Matt returned home on Thursday evening, everything seemed normal. Susan, pretending to be an obedient wife, walked around him on tiptoe. The real surprise came when Dan sent a text message in which he confirmed that he wanted to come on Friday to discuss the situation. Susan couldn't help but smile, thinking that Dan was finally going to put an end to everything. Perhaps the incident with the car scared him enough for him to stop. When Matt went to work on Friday morning, there was tension in the air. At 11 in the morning, Susan got a call from Matt at work. He urgently informed her that she needed to see something important. Matt explained that he had just received a video clip on their personal email that she needed to watch. Susan quickly opened their email on her phone, found the message and turned on the video. Despite the poor quality and short duration, only 20 seconds, it was clear that Susan and Dan were making love in the video. The sender was an anonymous address. Oh my god, is this our bedroom? It's hard to make out, but it seems to be sunny there. It seems to be noon, but I can't say for sure, Matt asked. Susan knew the time perfectly well, but she just answered, I'm not sure. Perhaps the frame has been edited and the lighting is broken. Matt, you sent the video, didn't you? She asked. You seem to like it, he replied sarcastically. Susan didn't pay much attention to this remark. She had more pressing matters to attend to and she could discuss her worries with Matt later when he arrived home. Matt persisted, insisting that what Dan was playing was the topic he wanted to touch on that evening. 
He asked if this was a form of torture, noting that Susan did not lose her temper and did not threaten Dan. Susan denied it at first, but then remembered that she had told Dan about her plans to end the relationship. She wondered if Dan's reaction to the news was negative, and if he had rigged the video in an attempt to save their relationship. Dan had two days to plan, and he had plenty of opportunities to do so. Matt noted that Dan was not at work. Susan desperately wanted to get in touch with him to discuss their recent affairs. At that moment, her phone buzzed with an urgent, call me notification. It was her sister, Diana. Susan knew she had to answer, hoping it would give her time to collect her thoughts. She hung up on Matt and dialed Diana's number, but she was bombarded with questions and criticism. Susan discovered that her sister had also received the same video clip. Her phone was constantly buzzing with calls from close friends and even her mother. Could it be that they all got the same video? Susan couldn't believe it. It was a complete disaster. There was no way Matt could be behind this. It had to be Dan. Susan was furious. She tried to call Dan several times, but he didn't answer the phone. She didn't know that Matt had taken Dan's phone while he was in a meeting at work. He threw away the battery, but left the phone and SIM card, throwing them in the trash. Leaving the envelope on Dan's desk, he called Susan to discuss the video, and then quietly left work. When Matt got home, he enjoyed watching his wife get upset and confused. She was upset that her mother had seen the video and worried about what her family and friends would think. Matt continued to fuel her anxiety by making useless suggestions. Susan continued to ignore Dan's midweek visit, unable to shake off the feelings of regret and guilt that consumed her. How could it happen that everything got out of control so quickly? She had never imagined herself capable of having an affair, until that fateful night at the party when alcohol spurred her flirtation with Dan. His charm and interest in her were undeniable, and she couldn't resist his advances. After a few weeks, Susan began to justify her actions, convincing herself that she deserved a little thrill in her life. But deep down, she was tormented by doubts about when a video could have been made about her careless treatment of Dan, and this reinforced her growing sense of anxiety. She was hesitant to jeopardize her relationship with Matt. Seeing her friend's marriage crumble because of such indiscretion, she was wary, but believed that her plan was cunning enough to avoid any consequences. The idea that Matt would find out about the affair seemed unlikely, because he already knew about it. Thinking through the logistics turned into an exciting puzzle for her. She saw it as a brilliant decision, but she didn't think about how it would affect Matt. She was in agony. Everyone adored Matt, and everyone knew that she had betrayed him. The thought of having to justify her actions terrified her. How can she explain herself? No one would believe that Matt knew about her affair with Dan. But none of that mattered as long as she could convince Matt that it wasn't her fault. The screeching of tires announced Dan's arrival at Matt and Susan's house. Susan met him with a furious onslaught. Matt stood off to the side, blankly watching the deep scratch on Dan's cheek. After some effort, Dan managed to pin Susan against the wall until she finally spoke. Despite the fact that Dan found out about the video, he categorically denied that he filmed or sent it. Susan became increasingly upset and demanded to know who was to blame for this, if not him. Surprisingly, Matt started laughing and admitted that it must have been him. Susan and Dan were speechless. Dan was the first to understand the truth. So, you found out about our meeting this week? Matt confusedly confessed. Alas, yes. Susan tried to explain it as a continuation of their agreement, but Dan quickly realized the significance of the video. Knowing that they had already discussed this issue earlier, he felt that Matt had recorded the entire incident. Trying to relieve the tension, Dan apologized to Matt. I'm sorry, Matt. I couldn't control myself, Susan interjected. I never meant to hurt you. I made a mistake in judgment and let my emotions get the better of me. I will terminate the contract and ignore the financial differences, Dan said. That's very kind of you, but I'm sorry. Everything has already been done. You will see my resignation letter on your desk, Matt said. You can't do this, Matt. How can we buy back the house? 
Susan intervened. Don't worry, dear. The house will be for sale tomorrow, Matt reassured her. Dan quickly added, Don't resign, Matt. We can survive this. The firm really needs you. You have a deep understanding of the business and our customers. Matt smiled. I think it's true. It seems that's why your main competitor made me a job offer. I have a feeling that many, if not most, of our customers will follow me. Since you owe me more vacation days than the four-week deadline, I'm not coming back, Matt said. Dan's insincere smile disappeared when Matt spoke again. I think some of our colleagues will leave too. I informed them of my departure and it seems they doubt your ability to support the company. Dan said rudely, You really should change your mind, Matt. You could end up in jail. I doubt it very much, Dan. Do you want to involve your mistress in this case? She received half of the fraudulent payments, not to mention that you tried to blackmail me. And now I have your confession on video thanks to a small device that I purchased. The recording is now in the hands of my lawyer. Also, you may notice that some of your files have mysteriously disappeared, and I know that you haven't backed them up remotely. It's always good to have supportive colleagues, but you don't seem to know about it, Matt said with a grin. This tape will never appear in the courtroom, Dan replied. Interestingly, my lawyer said something completely different, but I have other plans for her, and when all is said and done, your business will be in ruins. On the other hand, my new company may acquire yours. I heard that their new CEO is a good guy. Susan understood that Dan's wealth and business were at risk compared to her own. She decided to take action against him. Dan was speechless when Susan began to pose as a victim, claiming that this was all Dan's idea and that she was forced to do it to save him from prison. She confessed her love for Matt and asked for his forgiveness, blaming her confusion and Dan's actions. Dan couldn't believe the audacity of her lies and muttered to himself, calling her a two-faced lying trash. Matt just smiled at how accurately Dan described Susan. My dear wife, it has dawned on me that, in addition to the incriminating video, I also overheard you admit on the phone that this scheme was your doing, a deceptive cover for an affair. The divorce papers are waiting for you in the kitchen drawer. You're leaving tonight, and you have to fulfill the terms of the divorce, otherwise these videos may get to our loved ones. Your mother will undoubtedly be saddened to learn of your infidelity, Matt said. Susan was sobbing uncontrollably as she collapsed to the ground. Matt turned to Dan with a sly smile on his face. Do you think we should take her with us? Dan shook his head and replied, No way. She's caused us more trouble than she's worth. Matt nodded in agreement and added, I couldn't agree more. Dan warned me. It's not over yet, Matt. Grinning, Matt replied, It's true. Suddenly, in a fit of rage, Matt hit Dan. His fist smashed into Dan's jaw, sending him to the ground and he couldn't tell who was more shocked by the sudden turn of events. Now, it was the end. Matt replayed the recording several times, lamenting most of it, but finding satisfaction in the part where Dan and Susan worried about his possible exposure and subsequent descent into madness. A knife stuck in a hood is a melodrama that he couldn't help but appreciate, and a rare smile graced his lips after weeks of tension. After getting a new job at a rival company, Dynamite successfully lured customers and employees away, winning the ultimate act of revenge. Dan held on as long as he could, but in the end he was forced to declare his business bankrupt, and rumors began to spread about his own financial collapse. Soon after, he quietly left the area. Susan stayed in a modest apartment with the proceeds from the sale of the house, since Matt did not provide her with any financial support. Having no skills or work experience, she got two temporary jobs, a maid and a waitress. Her once close circle of friends turned away from her, and she became estranged from her mother and sister. After receiving a raise in salary and bonuses, Matt was able to switch to a three-day work week, which allowed him to finally set aside time for sports and outdoor activities, which he neglected during his marriage. He realized how much Susan influenced his decisions, from buying a big house to filling it with unnecessary things. Deciding to change the situation, 
Matt wasted no time selling the house and reducing the number of things. Despite the breakup of his marriage, Matt continued to communicate with his mother and sister Susan. Diana, in particular, constantly apologized for Sarah's infidelity and assured Matt that he would never repeat her mistake. This support helped Matt move forward and focus on rebuilding his life. It would be great to reveal this information at some point, especially because Susan would be furious. Louis Anacortes, a 33-year-old man, sat on a recently cleaned bench made of marine teak and iron, which overlooked Lake Riffey. In the past, he and his family went boating on the lake more than once. He studied the shiny brass plaque on the bench that the Edmonds family of Mossy Rock donated in honor of their grandfather, Kennewick Edmonds. The sign said that the bench was intended for everyone, so that they could appreciate the natural beauty of the surroundings, which their grandfather treasured so much. Lewis, being a local resident, couldn't help but smile bitterly as he read the inscription. He understood why old Kennewick had a special love for this place, especially considering that there was a bench in his honor. From the observation deck, there was a beautiful view of the crystal blue water that now covered Kennewick's childhood home thanks to the Mossy Rock Dam, built by Tacoma City Light many years ago to power the city. For Lewis, it was a bittersweet reminder of the past. Lewis knew that the city of Riff existed somewhere, but it was hidden 60 feet below the sparkling surface of the lake. The water reflected the stunning blue sky and the ragged clouds above it. Native pines grew in the forest surrounding the lake, and western white and panders reached a height of more than 36 feet. Since childhood, Lewis had dreamed of climbing one of these tall trees and seeing if he could reach the endless sky above. A dear memory of his father remained in his memory. When he was a little boy, they spent a peaceful afternoon on the shore of the lake, lying on their backs and leaning G.L. Leonard's bamboo fishing rods against a tree. The rods were ready to catch salmon that filled the waters of the lake. Together they looked at the sky, admiring the beauty of nature and enjoying a moment of relaxation. It was at this time that he shared with his father his desire to climb to the top of one of the tall pines. Lewis's father was silent for several minutes, completely ignoring Lewis's words. And so, when Lewis began to think that his father had not heard him, he suddenly began to hum the melody from the Jimi Hendrix song, Purple Haze. Forgive me while I kiss the sky, my father sang, his voice not too melodious. Despite his lack of singing talent, his father was never shy about humming a tune. Whenever he sang this line, an exhausted Lewis looked around, hoping that there was no one nearby who could witness his father singing the song out of tune. In adulthood, the memories of this incident remain vivid and pleasant for Lewis. The loss of both parents to cancer at a young age, as well as his knowledge of genetics, played a role in this meeting. The brevity of life became clear to him. Lewis drew attention to the nearly 23-mile-long lake, which was shrouded in darkness, symbolizing the loss that had befallen the once vibrant Riff community. The darkness hid all traces of its presence so that it would never be born again. Lewis saw this as a fitting comparison to his marriage. To an outsider unaware of the turmoil he had experienced, this scene might have seemed peaceful, with the beauty of the warm autumn weather in the Pacific Northwest. Despite the outdated name, the locals still called this period of time Indian Summer. There is no better time and place on Earth for its onset. This makes nine months of dreary rains almost unbearable. Although Lewis looked calm on the outside, he was full of anger on the inside. He had to face this nightmare alone, being the only child who had few friends outside the fire station. None of the guys at the station could provide Lewis with support as it is shown on TV. Firefighters rarely discuss their fears and emotions or share intimate moments with colleagues. Showing weakness is seen as a threat to trust and can lead to serious consequences in their work. In life-threatening situations, every moment is important, and any hesitation caused by uncertainty about a teammate's abilities can be deadly. In this aspect, 
Lewis felt completely isolated. He deliberately decided to arrive early because he believed in the healing properties of his beloved lake and natural oils. He hoped that they would help him reschedule the upcoming meeting with his already ex-wife, which she had asked for. The lawyer advised him to agree to the meeting, as it would benefit his case in the family court. Despite the advice of a lawyer, Blaine opposed this process, and his lawyer was very unhappy. Lewis was puzzled by Blaine's stubborn belief that their marriage would be able to withstand her mental state. She adamantly demanded mandatory consultations with her lawyer, despite the fact that the judge of the family court in Washington was unable to obtain them. Both lawyers tried to reason with Blaine, but their efforts were unsuccessful. Lewis believed Blaine needed therapy, but he no longer felt responsible for her well-being. He sighed to himself, resigned to the fact that their marriage would end on that day. Blaine could have asked for a meeting, but Lewis was adamantly opposed to meeting on the spot. He was sure that the summer crowds had already dispersed, and the place for them remained empty. This meeting wasn't supposed to go the way Blaine had planned. Glancing at his watch, he noted that she would be arriving soon, but he knew he had plenty of time. After all, Blaine had a long drive ahead of him on a 12-kilometer highway that she hated. Punctuality was not her strong suit, as evidenced by her tardiness on the wedding day. She arrived an hour late, which made him chuckle cynically as the memories came flooding back. He remembered a joke from his best man 13 years ago, who suggested that he leave the church after being only 20 minutes late. But he quickly pushed the thought away. In truth, the first 12 and a half years of his marriage to Blaine were the perfect dream. Lewis adored his two daughters, Rainier and Lacey, more than anything in the world. Rain, or Rainy, as she was affectionately called, was a real daddy's daughter. She had already started going to school and aspired to fulfill her dream of becoming a firefighter, which her father inspired her to do. At the same time, Lacey looked like her mother. For Lewis, this created another problem. Family courts prefer to keep children together, and in Washington state, there is no specific age when a child can choose which parent to live with after a divorce. Despite this, the lawyer assured him that there are still options. Washington's divorce and child custody laws can be complicated, but they allow a married couple to jointly draw up a child care plan that can be submitted to the court. If the judge considers the plan to be thorough, complete, and fair to children, it is usually approved without any changes. Lewis's lawyer advised him that the main thing was to convince his wife to agree to a difficult offer, which Lewis hoped she would eventually accept. Being a pragmatic person, Lewis understood how important it was to find a practical solution to their situation. Even before receiving confirmation from his lawyer, he realized that his position as a firefighter with the Riverside Fire Department, also known as the RFA, would most likely prevent him from obtaining primary custody of his daughters. The dangerous aspects of work and the irregular shift schedule have created significant difficulties in obtaining custody. It took a lot of time and financial resources to develop the plan that he initiated. As soon as he closed his eyes, he was transported back to that fateful day a few months before when his unimaginable nightmare began. I don't know if he was living in an episode of the Twilight Zone or stuck in an endless loop like Groundhog Day. His reality seemed both surreal and frighteningly repetitive. Lewis, honey, can we talk in the living room? Please. Her voice interrupted his routine as he put the girls to sleep in their room. Despite the fact that he needed to rest before his daily shift in the morning, he was looking forward to the opportunity to talk to his wife. He hoped Blaine shared his excitement about their shared goal of owning their own home. Currently, the four of them lived in a rented three-bedroom apartment, but now that their careers were stable, they couldn't wait to get a permanent home. They both believed that it would be much better and safer to raise their daughters in their own home. As he walked into the living room, thoughts of their future together were spinning in his head. Taking a bottle of water from the refrigerator, 
he went into the kitchen and settled down on the familiar worn sofa that he inherited from his parents. Turning to Blaine, he swung his right leg over his left and carefully tucked her loose blonde hair behind her ear. Putting his hand on her shoulder, he asked, How are you, honey? Further memories were hazy for him. The memories of their conversation were mostly fragmentary, soul-piercing heartbeats in a kaleidoscope of shock, disbelief, and anger. But his reaction was crystal clear. Months later, he was still puzzled by how shockingly weak and emotional his reaction was. He was crying, really crying in front of her. It was so pathetic that he felt sorry for Blaine. He stumbled out of the house and walked away from the source of his torment. One of the positive aspects of a firefighter's job was the availability of a free cot where you could sleep without asking questions about your constant presence. The team was aware of the high divorce rate in their profession. As the days passed, he gradually gathered together the information that his wife had shared with him. She did not ask his permission, but simply informed him of her plans. When he returned home, he planned to beg his wife not to leave the family and think about visiting a psychologist together to try to save their marriage. As soon as he started, he was suddenly surprised by the unexpected appearance of his affectionate and naive daughters. Blaine assured him that they would be waiting for him at her parents' house. Turning around, he saw his wife standing with a sly, triumphant smile on her face. The love he had once felt for her was gone, replaced by fierce hatred. He stared at Blaine, and his usually calm expression twisted with rage, close to madness. The expression of superiority disappeared, replaced by fear. At that moment, his daughters launched a full-scale attack. In innocent confusion, they demanded to know why he was leaving them. He had to break free from the tight embrace of Rain and Lacey, who were begging, screaming, and crying. Rain was crying especially hard. Dad... How can I become a firefighter without you? He knew that this heartbreaking moment would haunt him for the rest of his days. Despite the end result, Lewis understood that in the future, the possible consequences for his comrades would be even more deplorable. In the end, he was grateful to Blaine. In an instant, he turned from a vulnerable target into a determined man with clear intentions. Instantly, Lewis mentally expressed his gratitude. He regained his self-respect and began the first stages of healing. He is currently expressing his gratitude. He admitted that it was not easy for them and expressed the hope that one day they would understand his act. My mom and I are not on the best of terms because we have different goals in life, but I want you to know that I will always be there for you. I will see you regularly and love you endlessly. Without looking back at Blaine, Lewis left his apartment for the last time, escaping from the arms of his daughters. Since that day, he has not spoken to his now ex-wife, preferring to entrust the case to his lawyer. Lewis didn't know if he was asleep or just lost in memories. Hello, Lewis. Thank you for coming to meet me, she said. Her voice, once soothing and caring, now resembled nails on a chalkboard. He shook his head to switch over. It's time to do what his lawyer advised. In an ideal world, he would never have to see her face again. He did not look in her direction, but fixed his gaze on the lake, comforted by its calm presence. He noted her surprise with a small smile and finally turned to face her. I understand that this is about you, Blaine, he began. But before we go any further, I have to say something. This will be our last conversation on this topic. If you start coming up with the same hackneyed excuses again, then there will be no conversation. Louis, I do not know. Blaine was sure that the marriage could not be saved. If you mention again how much you love me, if you hint that the problems arise only because of my fragile female ego, if you even hint that I am to blame for the collapse of the family, I will leave. At the moment, your presence repels me to the point of physical nausea. I love you all, I said, my voice full of emotion as I gently touched her face. But let me save you the trouble, Blaine. He gestured at a large manila envelope lying on the bench seat. These are the divorce papers that will end our marriage. Take them with you when you leave in a few minutes. Your lawyer will review them 
and you will need to sign them and then return them to my lawyer's office within 36 hours. Turning away to admire the breathtaking view once more, he continued to speak. My lawyer will check that all aspects of this agreement comply with the state's requirements for a parenting plan, but I'm not interested in prolonging the situation, and I don't want to stay married to an unfaithful spouse, so it would be better for both of us to get divorced. It is very important to pay close attention to such details. Lewis sighed in disappointment, realizing that Blaine would probably complicate the situation even more. The parenting plan is the most important aspect that the family court will pay attention to. My offer is reasonable, given our limited savings. You will get custody of the girls, and I will not argue with you about this decision. Blaine snorted. Girls need a mother, and even though you weren't the best wife, you were a decent mother. You will leave the apartment so that the girls don't have to change schools or look for new friends. I will take over half of the housing costs and will pay alimony more than the required minimum. I will also meet my daughters regularly. Everything is described in detail in this agreement. A lot of emotions raced through Blaine's head. She felt surprise, joy, and sadness at the same time. She hoped that Lewis's love for their daughters would be enough to make him stay and save their marriage. But it was at that moment that Blaine realized the true extent of her loss, and tears flowed of their own accord. Look, Blaine, Lewis began. The truth is, with my busy work schedule and the dangers associated with my job, I know I have no chance of getting custody of the girls. Even if you got intimate with the entire Seahawks football team on the 50-yard line at halftime of a playoff game, it wouldn't change the truth. Lewis? We can't? Please don't interrupt, Blaine. We're just getting down to business. It's very important that you listen carefully to what's going to happen next. He gave her an impatient look, took out a thick envelope the size of a letter from his pocket, and handed it to her. She opened it and began to examine the documents inside. As I said before, if within 36 hours you do not sign the divorce papers and hand them over to my lawyer, a detailed report on what led to the breakup of our marriage, evidence of your infidelity will be sent to everyone you know, including your family, colleagues, and supervisor. This document outlines what you have been doing, and the consequences of failure will be costly. The cost of getting the investigator's report may have been high, but Lewis thought it was worth every penny. He was determined to ensure that his daughters fully understood how and why their family had been torn apart. Blaine, on the other hand, was stunned by the information contained in the report. It was difficult for her to accept that her lover was capable of such actions. She was sure Lewis was probably lying. Despite his doubts, Lewis understood that revealing the truth would cause his daughter great pain. He hesitated not knowing if he had the strength to complete his plan to uncover the truth. But he hoped that it would not come to such extreme measures. In addition, he could face legal consequences, including imprisonment and loss of his job. The laws of retaliation against adult films posed a double threat. Besides, he hoped his wife would live up to Lewis's expectations. It is important to note that Blaine is not such a submissive and easily deceived person as is commonly believed. The main thing, Blaine, is that the documents are signed in accordance with my instructions. If your lawyer contacts mine and mentions me and my client, then you'll regret it. If he changes even one comma, period, or semicolon, the gloves will be off and the whole world will know what a bitch you are. Blaine, shaken to the core, continued to scroll through the investigator's report. Throughout Lewis's monologue, she could only utter meaningless sounds, snort and cry, only shaking her head in disbelief. This shouldn't have happened. Why can't Lewis understand? I propose a mutual agreement that will benefit both of us. In exchange for your cooperation, I assure you that I will never speak negatively of you or hold you responsible for the breakup of our family in the presence of our daughters. I'm even ready to be cordial towards your partner if we end up in the same place, for example, at our daughter's birthday party. I'll even shake his hand no matter how unpleasant it is for me. I will behave respectfully and politely, as if we have decided to part amicably. I will show the same courtesy to your family and friends. 
I can also babysit if you and your partner want to leave at the last moment for the weekend. I will be the best ex-husband for any unfaithful wife. Thank you, Lewis, but this is all unnecessary. Stop it, Blaine. Don't mention this man's name to me. Lewis, he's a good guy. No, Blaine, not good. Let's get down to business. Whose idea was it to tell me about your relationship? It was him, Lewis. He said it's not good to deceive a good person like you. Lewis grinned mockingly, interrupting Blaine. Nonsense, Blaine, he said. He did it to make sure he gets the same reaction from me as he does from you. I've already asked if he's going to move in with you. Her eyes widened and her mouth dropped open in surprise. Louis couldn't help but think that she looked like one of her favorite emojis. Blaine was silent, looking at her tightly clenched hands. Her posture was so tense and fragile that it seemed as if she was afraid that the slightest movement might break her. Blaine, Lewis said confidently, the evidence is right in front of you. He gestured at the papers she was holding in her hands. You are not the only one, and there will be others after you. His story speaks for itself. But he's different with me, she whispered softly. Lewis smiled knowingly and took a deep breath feeling calmness envelop him. Another light breeze from his beloved lake touched his face, heralding the imminent end of the journey. Confident in his choice and controlling the risks, he was confident that everything would turn out exactly as he had planned. Speaking in a softer tone, he called out, Look at me, Blaine, we're almost done. It's very important that you focus. When Blaine met his gaze, her tear-stained face showed a mixture of emotions reflecting her confusion. The mascara smeared and my heart was filled with horror. The once perfect world was crumbling before my eyes. When she met Lewis's gaze, she was met with a cold, stony expression and eyes as dark as night, penetrating into the very soul. Take care of my girls, Blaine, he pleaded, his voice shaking with fear. They're our girls, Lewis, she protested weakly, embarrassed that her words had turned into a question. But Lewis's response was firm and relentless. No, Blaine, it's not like that. These are my girls. You betrayed them and abandoned them just like you abandoned me. You're vulnerable and you can't control yourself. I need you to look after them for a while. What do you mean? Her fear was almost palpable. I will never let them go. But you've already let them go, you just don't know it yet. Your boyfriend will appreciate it. Honey, try some of this. This will enhance your intimacy. Your physical connection will be incredibly intense. All your senses will ignite. He's going to start introducing you to his friends soon. Come on, darling. Justin is a good guy. Blaine slowly shook her head, staring into space and whispered, He won't betray me. He loves me. Go to hell, Blaine, Lewis exclaimed, his anger obvious. In a few months, this jerk will be molesting women in his usual places. Lewis was furious. But fortunately, I still have a couple of years until I finish the courses required to get a bachelor's degree in firefighting. When this is done, I will be able to apply for the role of fire marshal when Frank retires. Then I won't have so many mandatory hours. Most likely it will coincide with the fall. That's when I'll seek full custody. By then you might be too carried away to even notice it. You're wrong. He's not who you think he is. Please, Lewis, stop it. I love our family. Can't you see? She cried angrily. You've never understood me. I truly believe that you are capable of loving only yourself. And I foolishly fell in love with the one I thought you were. I was just a pawn in your game. The girls only increased your control over me. And when your terrible boyfriend showed up, you immediately fell into his trap. You left your family without a second thought. Maybe we can try again, she said with tears in her eyes. No, Blaine, we can't. We don't have anything else to start over. I saw that you are not capable of true love and compassion. You hide behind a facade of contentment, but deep down, you know the truth. You are entangled in a web of lies and denial unable to break free. The fear of facing your own shortcomings keeps you tied to a toxic relationship. It's time to acknowledge the reality of the situation and find the strength to let go of the charade. 
Only then will you be able to truly recover and find true happiness and satisfaction. It will be difficult for you to accept the truth of what I have learned. Now you have to face your true self and accept it for the rest of your miserable existence. But if I'm wrong, and you really share a deep love, it won't be long before your charming partner starts hinting that you have childcare responsibilities. He may suggest that I take on more responsibilities, hinting that you don't know how to prioritize. You shouldn't object to him for fear of losing the idealized intimacy that you both share. When you informed me that I would have to share you with this parasite, it reminded me of your previous words. If he decides to leave you after he proposed, persuaded and eventually threatened that he would do it if you didn't give the girls to me, then you'll go back to where you started, won't you? He chuckled when he saw her puzzled expression. In the end, I'll win and you'll lose. It's only a matter of time, and I'm willing to wait. Lewis looked back at the serene blue lake. The breeze died down for a moment, and the water became as still as glass. It was the signal to set sail. He promised himself that he would return here often with his daughters. Although his girls already adored this place, he wanted them to cherish it as deeply as he did. When he got to his feet, not because he was done, but because the adrenaline surging in him no longer allowed him to stay in place, he realized that he had to solve the last important issue with her. Lewis carefully walked around the bench, wrapping his arms tightly around the lacquered teak, and bent down to whisper in Blaine's ear. In a low voice full of anger, he warned her to tell her lover that if he ever crossed the line in a relationship with his daughters, whether it was using illegal drugs or inappropriate behavior, it would entail serious consequences. I will spy on him. I'll finish him off. Let him know that he doesn't need to hide or be on the lookout, because I'll find him everywhere. I want him to understand in the last minutes of his life that I am responsible for ending his miserable existence on this planet. The same goes for you, Blaine. His voice was trembling, and his throat was dry with tension. His grip was getting tighter, adrenaline pumping with every word he threw at her. Will you tell him that? Is that really you, Blaine? Asked Lewis, and immediately there was a loud crack as the hardwood grate gave way. Blaine was startled by the unexpected noise, and Lewis curiously examined the broken piece, noting that it must be due to dry rot. Blaine refused to meet his eyes, bursting into tears and whimpering. Her body was shaking as if she was frozen. Remember, Blaine? It's 36 hours, not 37, Lewis reminded her before announcing. And now I'm leaving. Examining his hands, he noticed broken nails, bloody knuckles, and shards embedded in the skin. Surprisingly, he didn't feel any pain. Half a year later, Lewis was promoted, and he took his beloved daughters to himself. He was impatiently waiting for this moment. As Lewis had said, Blaine was just a temporary sweetheart for this bastard who offered her to his friends. Soon she ran away from the city and occasionally called the girls. Apparently, she understood how she was wrong and she was ashamed that she had destroyed our family.